welcome back to another episode of Grizzly True Crime, another live stream with me, Gizilla K. If you are new here, I'm South African, living in the Netherlands. A lot of people asked me in the beginning, what is that accent? So, welcome to today's deep dive on the West trial. Um, if you didn't know, I wonder if you know about this case at all. Let me know. Thank you so much, Amanda, for becoming a member. Welcome, everyone. Um, right. So, I have covered this case before. But it was literally a year ago. That episode is in the description box if you want to check it out. What we're going to do today is there's been 20 days of the trial. So while Letitia Stark's trial is going on and Lori Vello, of which I posted Lori Vello's <laughs> latest mugshots, whoa, on my community tab. So go check it out after if you haven't seen it yet. It's also on Twitter. Um, so what I've done is while that was going on, this trial was also going on, the West trial. The trial of Trezell and Jacqueline West, okay? So we're going to do a quick case recap, and then we're going to do bullet points for 20 days worth of trial. Tomorrow is closing arguments. Now, before I get started with that, I do just want to say the following things. Number one, this trial has been very hard to follow because you can only listen to the audio from the courtroom while it's happening, and you're not allowed to stream it. You're not allowed to share that audio. Some people be naughty illegal actually, and have been streaming there. The only thing that's available now for us to see with our own eyes are the opening statements. So I have that lined up for us today, which was shared by a news station five days ago. And the opening statements occurred already on March 28th. So they're sharing it way later, but that's where cameras were allowed in the courtroom. For the rest of the time, it's only been audio, only while it's happening, can you be there and take notes? So. That is why it's also been <laughs> very difficult to follow. I do want to say there's two amazing ladies out there, okay, that have been making notes as well. One is Veronica Morley on Twitter, a reporter that tweeted out as the audio was happening every single line just about. So guess what I've been doing? Reading every line. And then also a YouTuber called Lawyer mystery maven now both of these sources i'm going to link in the description box as well because man without them it would have been hard to put it all together so i think between the three of us i hope i um, <laughs> do a good job today thank you jess white welcome to membership okay so let's put this over here so this firstly is for adults only, okay? It's, again, a very sad case involving children, so trigger warning. And these little boys, age four and three, their bodies have never been found, but their adoptive parents are on trial for their murder, okay? So their names are Sincere and Classic Peters. But you'll see online, people often, you might have heard Oren and Orson West, that's their adoptive names. Already a year ago, we had like, it's not really a rant, but it was just, I just stand for saying their birth names, especially because their adoptive parents are on trial for their murder. You know what I mean? So, and they adopted them in 2018. And by 2020, they were dead. So sincere and classic Peter's I think we can remember them that way, right? Day one, Hawkeye Seneca says, day one, justice for classic and sincere. Yes. So I do always do my best to get to all these trials and updates, but I'm just one person. But let's hope I did a good job for you today. Let's go for it. We are going to relook at the interview that Trezell and Jacqueline West did. It was red flag central. It was like when we watched that interview, it's like watching Chris Watts on the porch. Remember that one? Um, yeah, it's it's one way we're like, whoa, this is a this is very dodgy, very shady. They must be hiding something, right? Um, so that okay. So see a classic Peters. They were reported missing by their adoptive parents on December twenty first, twenty twenty. There's already the first typo. We need a typo jar from Bakersfield. Okay, they were so they're from Bakersfield. That's where they were living with um, their adoptive parents and. They were reported missing in Cal City, California. And the parents had just moved there as well. So the timing was quite odd. Prosecutors say that they died 
three months before they reported missing. So that, those red flags we saw, oh, they were there. Those red flags were flying. Wow. So their bodies have very sadly never been found. And there's some details today that I'm like, whoa, it sounds like, I don't know what the parents did there. But it does sound like uh, like a dumpster or something like that. Very, very sad. The adoptive parents, Trezell and Jacqueline West, are on trial for their murders. A anonymous says, don't know anything about this trial, but something tells me what you're going to share will be another horrific, maddening case buckled up. Good job for buckling up there, anonymous. Yes. So we're going to look at all of that. We'll look at the interview as well. Now, Trezell, these are them. This, this is Trezell and Jacqueline West. They were arrested on March 1st, 2022. So it took quite a, a lot of time, as I say, these things take time, true crime, you know, it's not like a Netflix episode or something or Dateline, it's, it takes time. So it took some time, right? And they were arrested on March 1st, 2022. They faced two counts of second degree murder, two counts of child cruelty, falsely reporting an emergency, involuntary manslaughter and conspiracy. Jackie is asking, did they ever find any chalk on the back patio or any drawings with chalk on the back patio? Apparently not. And remember, there was that whole thing of maybe the dogs, the dog was called chalk. I mean, whoa, this story is quite hectic. So if you do want a, this is going to be a deep dive on the trial. If you want a, I think it was a pretty deep dive a year ago. Go and check out my original episode, uh, which is in the description box. All right. Yes. So, uh, yeah, Luna says, Jackie, the dog was called chalk. That's the thing. They said they were outside playing with chalk. So just so you know, they moved to uh, from Bakersfield to Cal City. And they actually had two other adoptive kids and two biological kids as well. Okay. So we're going to go over all that. Six kids and these two parents. And they moved and then said, uh, they called them, of course, Oren and Orson. They say, Oren and Orson were playing outside with chalk. And they must have escaped through the back gate. And then who knows what happened? And they just have such a crap story, you know. So we'll watch that before we dive into the opening statements. I just really want to see where this takes us here. Okay, so this is the trial. Trezell and Jacqueline West are charged with second degree murder, involuntary manslaughter and other offenses and face life terms in prison if convicted. Apparently that's 30 years where they're being, uh, where they're on trial. They had two other adopted children and two biological children when Oren and Orson went missing. The bodies of Oren and Orson have not been found. So I remember they were sincere and classic, but just for the sake of the bullet points in the trial, as we're following along, sometimes I write Oren and Orson because that's from, you know, the trial from hearing all those things, right? Okay. So the bodies of Oren and Orson or sincere and classic have not been found despite massive searches involving hundreds of people and an investigation that brought in multiple agencies, including the FBI. There has been a gag order on the case, so many new details have been revealed in the trial, which started on March 28th, 2023. Witnesses who are minors have been called to the stand, meaning other kids that lived in the house, other children that they had fostered in the past, they testified, which is also, I suppose, another reason why this is not being uh, broadcast. The trial has not been available to view publicly. Cameras were allowed during opening statements, but the rest of the trial has been audio only with no broadcasting allowed. So it's not like the Lori Vella one. You can't broadcast it. You can listen in and take notes and that's it. Closing arguments are anticipated to take place tomorrow, Tuesday, May 16th, 2023. The state and the defense have rested their case. The judge is Charles R. Bremer, uh, the prosecutor, Eric Smith. Defense, there's... Both Trezell and Jacqueline each have actually two defense attorneys, so I'm probably missing a name here. Timothy Hennessy, Alexia Torres, uh, Stallings, and Fatima Rodriguez. The case against the West is built on circumstantial evidence because they don't, they haven't found the bodies very sadly. Okay, so let's see. I think this now will take us to, oh, so we still got a picture here. The West family, 2019 and early 2020. So they went missing around September, well, they were murdered in September of 2020 and reported missing December 21st, 2020. But here are some pictures that were shown um, in the opening statements that I just made a little bit bigger for you so you can see it of the six kids, two, three, four, five, six kids, yes, and Trezell and uh, Jacqueline. Christy says, are the closing arguments going to be broadcast? I don't believe so. I think it's the same format as they have been doing. 
So I'll be monitoring that link. You know, I'll see what updates I can get from that. But I don't think so. From what I'm gathering, from what I can see, from what the court is saying, it seems not. I mean, if it is, then, you know, you'll find me here. Otherwise, you'll find me later <laughs> with updates. So the family of eight lived at 1525 Lotus Lane, 116 Bakersfield, California. Sincere and Classic were adopted by Trezell and Jacqueline in 2018. Why? You might ask why. Why do they have four adopted kids? Well, they got uh, $1,000 in state benefits per child. It was their primary source of income. And the kids that testified said, yep, they treated the adopted kids very differently to their own kids. It's very sad. So, yes. Okay. Now, what I first want to show you before we look at, before we go into day one and two and onwards, there's 20 days that I've done bullet points <laughs> for you. I want to show you this interview that they did. Here we go. On December 23rd, 2020, two days after they reported the children missing, this would be at that new home which they had moved into. So just hold on one second. I want to show you this quickly because <laughs> I do have that ready for you too. We've got lots of things to look at. Okay, let's quickly just do this um, on the map. All right. So I just want to show you where, where, what, what's the area? What are we looking at? So they lived at this um, Casa Loma apartment. So you're going to see that come up as well in all these bullet points. And then they suddenly moved to this 10717 Aspen Avenue to Cal City. So from Bakersfield to Cal City, they moved there after the boys were murdered that we now know, but were, went missing and only reported them missing once they were settled there. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. All right, sorry for missing a few. I'm missing a few things here. Just hold on one second. Jody Lee says, thank you for covering cases that tend to be forgotten. Oh, thank you, Jody Lee. And Sassy says, gee, thanks. They get more dollars for siblings. Yes, and especially if they special needs and things like that. I mean, it's devastating. So that's what we're looking at, okay? We can zoom in later if we really want to, but we have before as well on that previous episode. So this interview that you're going to see now takes place here at this 10717 Aspen Avenue property. There we go. Let's make it face north. If I put the little man here, <laughs> which we haven't done in a while, there we go. This is the house where they say, no, man, the boys were just, they were playing in the backyard. Um, J Jacqueline says she was inside wrapping Christmas gifts. Boys were playing there, and then they must have escaped. You know, they say Trezell left the gate open when he went to fetch firewood. But they hardly searched for them. It's just freaking dodgy. So this is what we're dealing with, okay? Right? So now, let's look at the interview. For all the support we've seen, we've felt so helpless. And seeing everybody out here really looking and helping out really means a lot. So, tell us what happened the night before. Okay. From our yard. Okay. It was cold. I was going to make a fire. So a lot of wood. <laughs> you see him go. I won't interrupt too much because we this deep dive might take three hours. I'm just saying. We've got a lot of Buddha points. 20 days of trial. We're just recapping the whole trial <laughs> in one stream. Okay, so here we go. Point is, but he's like, okay, it was cold. I mean, now he's just narrating his story. Like, it was cold. It was dark. It was this. It was that. Like, oh, my word. You saw him take that deep breath and be like, okay, it was cold. We're right here next to our house. I open up the back gate. I'm throwing wood, bringing it inside the house. My wife's inside. She was actually wrapping gifts, so we thought it was a good idea. And they got our youngest to go outside and play with chalk in the back patio. Do not let them go on the dirt in the backyard. We keep them close. So I was playing with chalk, and I came in the house. I saw them there. I went in the house. I came back out. I didn't see them there. I immediately went back in, asked my wife, did you see the boys? She said no. They should be outside playing with chalk. I said, well... See, that's what people are saying. They were outside playing with chalk. Now, I don't know if that means the dog or actually playing with chalk. People have argued about that quite a bit. 
please remember, yes, this is pandemic time, so they've got their masks on as well. And Sincere and Classic, known as Orin and Orson, were not there at the house. They were not there at all. Um, you'll hear the kids say later uh, from the bullet points that they say, some of the kids say, well, they were there, or, like Orin was there for one day. But they're not sure about Orson. They're not sure about that. They've got, you know, uh, very vague memories, which I don't blame them for at all. Firstly, they're just kids that testified as well. They're very stressed. And I think they've been through a lot of trauma as well. So this this is all BS right here. This is all the red flags you see in one place. And, I mean, Jacqueline is swaying from side to side and just like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, she's just, you know, trying to convince the media about this story. So... Yes, here we go. Um, BCTV says, is this the two little boys? Weren't they twins? They weren't twins. Uh, one was four and one was three. So I think I actually had their... I'm not going to go... Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to go back now, but I had their birthdays listed on the first slide. Okay, so here we carry on. I didn't see them, so I came back outside and I started searching my backyard. I searched the whole thing. I realized that I left the gate open and I panicked, came inside the house, searched the house, me and my wife. Once that... I didn't pan out. I got in the van. I looked down the street in both directions. It was getting dark, getting cold. And I got in the van and I hit a bunch of corners. I went down this street. I turned my light on. I searched. I searched. I called their names. I talked to a gentleman on the street on the other side over there. He didn't see me. So then I came home and I told my wife, we need to call the cops. Uh, it's getting dark and I need help. We got to get going. So I called the cops. The cops came. First thing they did was tell us to stay in the house so they can get a hold of us. And they had us just sitting there, and we wanted to keep searching. But everybody came out in droves, and I wanted to thank you guys that night, but we couldn't go outside. The cops told us the best are out here. The best are out here searching, and we appreciate it, and nobody ever... I mean, the cops just told them they may not search. These loving parents really wanted to, but you see, they blamed the cops. Now, the cops said, you have to stay in the house, you're not allowed to search. Like, oh my gosh, okay. I think, yes, uh, so Beverly Payne says Chalk is not the dog. I think in the trial they actually mentioned um, the dog's name. I just can't remember what it is. But I think they meant, but either way, it's a BS story. It doesn't matter whether it was Chalk the dog or Chalk outside. They weren't there at all. They weren't alive at this point. They were dead from three months before. How scary is that? This is three months after the boys are uh, believed to have been murdered. Be they were murdered uh, between September 1st and 11th, 2020. So... To think of the audacity of these two doing this media interview, whoa, three months later, it's it's <laughs> it's a lot. Never could tell, we could never talk to anybody, and that was the issue. We just want to thank everybody. We really want to and, thank uh, you guys. Please, if anybody has seen them, please call, let somebody know. It, it, it Call the cops. Call California C the City Police Department. Call them and let them know what you've seen, if you see anything. Our boys, they... They are going to be rambunctious, okay? They are going to be rambunctious. I mean, I, whenever I hear the word rambunctious, I think of this interview right here. It's just one of those. Like when we hear someone say, I just want them home, and then they're sucking their lips like that. Yeah, we think Chris was. This one, they are going to be rambunctious. Oh, wow, okay? And just like call the police, not even like, Call us or bring them to us. Just like, call the police. Okay. Uh, they are going to be here in this area. And I really would like to go in the houses. But it's not because I want to invade people's privacy. I just want to know if make they sure. make sure. That's it. Because I don't... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. If you got any questions. Oh, no, you're good. Oh, okay. I, I was just going to say, you know, this is the first time we're hearing from you guys. And I can't imagine what you guys are going through. I can't even fathom it. Um, who are you guys, for people who are thinking uh, that there's some kind of foul play involved? Um, you know, we just spoke to the biological mother. She says she had a conversation with you guys um, and that she thinks there's some kind of foul play involved. That she thinks you guys did something. And that's understandable. What's your, what's your response to that? I mean, <laughs> Jacqueline's response is like, that's understandable. Mm hmm Yeah. That's not a normal response. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, they think foul play. Yeah, that's understandable. What? It's understandable. I would think the same thing. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly the point. And if we can find our, find our babies, then guess what? That's that's no. And that's all I want is to find our babies. That's it. And I talked to her this morning, and I really wanted to tell her that um, I am completely sorry because 
we were entrusted with her children and they came to us and they became our children and we named them and they are they are our children and so we want them back so please if y'all could get back on your what you guys are doing we we'll should we should be able to get a hold of somebody but they took all of our tech so they wanted to i guess uh, just rule us out which makes sense as part of the investigation so that's pretty much it have you guys um you talked to police all last night yes um what so you guys willfully gave them your everything yes the car yes did they get it how did they get a search warrant I, I, I don't, know I don't see why they got one, but they got one. Yeah, we would have let them take one, anything. We would have let them take everything. We let them come in and search with us. We, we asked them to come do that. What did they take? Of course they did, because they knew the boys were not there. They're like, search everything you want. Don't know why they would get a search warrant. Oh, because you, you covered your tracks for three months already. Just tech. And that's it. Like our phones. From the house, they have Oh, well, uh, I guess, should I answer that? Or? Answer itself, yeah. Okay, so, into the, into the, okay, and I guess, I don't even know. I see, yeah, we seriously felt like we needed to be out here. We did. Uh, again, we were told the best are out here looking already, just to stay put. They have more questions. There was literally a cop with us the whole time in and there. He was he had sitting down. We would ask, can we go help? They had to sit he down. Said, nope. He said, no, we got the best out there. So we need not, you guys here in case we have more questions. I don't want you guys thinking we, we didn't try. We actually we looked tried. before we called we the police. Looked, yes. And I imagine the uh, mind boggling part is the search for information. What happened? Where are they? Yes. Et cetera, et cetera. And we're, yeah. And, and just so we are able to present the information correctly um at what time did you guys notice your kids went missing and at what time were they reported missing to the police it's about i, I believe i think it was about 4 30 going on five it was getting dark like i said five ish that's about it that's when everything played out and then when did you guys call the police to report that missing I after we searched yeah a little bit around here we it was dark so we definitely were, we got worried uh would you say it was maybe within an hour, a couple hours? No, it was within minutes of us. Within minutes, he says. Wayne, he says, wait. When did they report they're missing? December 21st, 2020. And they died between sub September 1st and 11th. Oh, yes. Also, Anne-Marie Chin says uh, the dog's names are Violet, Mia, and Nairobi. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Yeah, that, I did not remember that. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're, I think we're almost done with this interview. Let's carry on. We didn't finish with our search. Okay. It was within minutes. Okay. What do you guys want people at home to understand um, about this situation? For them, you know, even speaking about what you guys are feeling is difficult. What do you want them at home to understand about this whole situation? We're going through it. It's difficult. I, I mean, everybody's making their own, you know, their own conclusions. They don't know anything. We don't, we're not sure, exa like everything, we're not sure. We, we said what we knew, and if anybody has seen them, uh, or anything, please call the police department. Would you be willing to provide pictures, or do you have any? They, uh, I have older pictures. All my newest were on my phone. Okay. A lot of people are speaking of this as, you know, after the math, past tense. I want to talk about your kids in present tense. What kind of, what kind of boys are these? Tell, tell us about the boys. Very playful, very rambunctious, and they do love to wrestle. They, they do love to kind of get rough with each Our other. Kids. They're kids. Of course, they would love to go out, but we would, so during the pandemic, we weren't trying to go, you know, out here. And so we stay inside. Even what they're saying there makes no sense. <laughs> we stayed inside, except they were outside, playing with chalk. Then I went to get firewood. Then they ran out the door, or, you know, out the gate or whatever. Oh my gosh. Go out and search? Yes. yes, we did. We searched before we called the cops. That's, that was, that's what we yeah. were saying. What time did they come up missing? 
They came missing right before it got dark. <clears throat> and then we call. I, I searched that property. I even drove around the, the whole, this neighborhood right here. I even talked to a gentleman on that side, one of those streets over there. I said, did you see my some little black kids? You and that way looking for them? That's the way I was going to come. But when I came back home, I decided to call the cops because it was dark. They couldn't have got away that fast. And, and why did it take two people to go in the house and leave? two kids out here by themselves. It should have been one parent going in and one parent right here watching the child. Not two parents going in the house oh, oh, and leaving so you, two little kids out here by themselves for 10 minutes. No, they were in the backyard. And the so back gate was open. And the back gate was open and I was getting wood from so this lot here. Unresponsible and left the gate open. Left some little kids outside with the gate open. Sorry, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, you guys were ta talking about your boys who you're, you know, uh, I understand. Um, for a mother, uh, a mother's intuition, I know you were saying, and we, we'll get your names after this, but you were saying how you feel like they're in this area. Uh, do you feel the same way? And what is the intuition? What is the sense you get? What do you think happened to your boys? Do you think someone took them? Do you think they're lost? Do you think... Yeah, definitely. I definitely know they're not walking around. They're not that kind. They're, they, they do not just... Mm, you definitely know they're not walking around. Mm-hmm. That was a big tell. Yeah, I definitely know they're not walking around. Someone must have taken them. <sighs> these two are unbelievable. Oh, Roam around, all of, all of you know, all these patches. Yeah. They definitely, I think definitely would have been picked up or something. That's, that was my assumption. Have they ever taken off every no. 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 They've never taken off No. Either. Okay. So, I think my text goes a little far. It better not go too far. Just hold on. Should be good. Okay. So, that was the initial interview. They have never found their bodies, you guys. That's what's so sad about this case. They cannot be put to rest like they absolutely deserve to. They haven't found their bodies. So, this trial and the evidence against these two is based on circumstantial evidence. Yes. Okay. So, now... We're going to look at opening statements after this. Day one and two of the trial was the opening statements, starting on Tuesday, March 28, 2023. The prosecutor, Eric Smith, accuses the West of planning out the deaths of Orrin and Orson with an unknown co-conspirator who then killed the boys. The defense, however, argues that Jacqueline and Trezell are simply the parents of two missing children being punished by California City for being different. So, yes, there's been 20 days of trial. Tomorrow's closing arguments, okay? So, day 18, 19, and 20 was when it, the defense uh, made their statements and rested their case after day 20. So, tomorrow, closing arguments. First, the first witness was a 911 dispatcher who took Trezell's call when he reported the boys missing on December 21st, 2020, in Cal City, California. The second witness was Officer Joshua Flores, Cal City PD. Body cam showed Trezell saying that he might have left the gate open by mistake. Jacqueline tells officers the boys had to have left through the backyard. And on day two, they had Cal City PD Brian Henson. There was no sign of the boys at the Cal City home and in the neighborhood. There were no footprints. There were no dirty diapers or anything. Uh, the body cam and Trezell's interrogation was shown by, uh, there was an FBI agent, kind of like Agent Greaser, remember that? Oh my word, in the Letitia trial, but an FBI agent and Cal City PD. And Trezell was asked what his theory was of what happened to the boys. And he said he thought the boys left through the gate and he doesn't know what happened to them. Okay, so we've got that. Now what I'm gonna do here, I just wanna quickly check. So we're going to go to opening statements now, which is this. Sorry that the names, <laughs> I'm just looking because I left the names there a little long in my editing here. Okay, so these are the opening statements of the prosecution. So we're going to watch that now together. It's about uh, 35 minutes or so, but I've made it at 1.2 speed. Okay. Interesting. All right, so gonna. Oh, so some people were asking about that interview. Uh, some people are asking questions. Yeah, so some were press and some were the biological family that were there watching that media interview. 
and also starting to, you know, say to them, what are, what are we doing? You're responsible responsible for them. I'm like, what are you thinking? So, yes, okay. Here we go with the opening statements of the prosecution, which was on March 28th, 2023. But it shows kind of a, a view uh, of the house. You'll see the backyard. I actually just want to, I want to go back to where it starts. I'm sorry about the names on the screen. I just <laughs> left it on there slightly too long. It will go away in a moment, okay? Good morning. Uh, just some housekeeping things before I begin. I wanted to introduce the uh, investigating officer in this case. That's Detective uh, Thomas Hernandez from the Bakersfield Police Department. Uh, he was the one who took over the investigation from the Cal California City Police Department. He'll be here throughout the trial um, as the investigating officer of where the West live. And so that's the reason for the large TV. You, you'll figure it out once we get through it, but it shows kind of a, a view uh, of the house. You'll see the backyard, the house itself, and the street to the front. So the the television is here because it has better quality than, than kind of what you sense of that. You have the charges read to you in this case, essentially the murder of Orrin and Orson West by uh, Trezell and Jacqueline West. That's the essence of the charge. And Orson West, there's your photos. Orrin to the left, Orson to the right. Uh, their names when they were born were sincere and classic. They were adopted and in uh, initially they were foster children. But that is Orrin and Orson West. Their bodies have never been found, have never been found. Even with the attempts of the California City Police Department, the Bakersfield Police Department, the FBI, CHP helped, uh, Kern County Sheriff helped as well. Their bodies have never uh, been found. Now, they were adopted back in April of 2019. That's a photo you see up in the middle. That's actually the adoption ceremony. You can see uh, the family of Trezell West there to the left in the yellow. That's Wanda West. She'll be testifying in this case. It's the mother of Trezell West. You also see um, Jacqueline Trezell, and they're holding... Orrin and Orson. Ultimately, you'll hear testimony in this case that the primary source of income that the West had during this time was from uh, money they received from the state due to adoption. They actually had four children that were adopted. Each one of those children, they got around $1,000. So the primary source of income uh, when they were living in Cal City was the $4,000 they were receiving uh, for adopting these children from the state of California. The names of the other children you see there, uh, Devin, Damien, and also Adrian and Aiden. Those are the biological children of the West. So just one more time. This is the prosecution's opening statements from March 28, 2023. It wasn't broadcast at the time. No one was allowed to see this, you know, like to stream or record or anything, but they recently, the main news channels have released the opening statements for the prosecution and the opening statements for the defense. And that's pretty much it. It's tiny little clips they released along the way, but the rest of the trial has been audio only, and you can only listen to it while it's happening and take notes, and then it's done. It's not archived anywhere or saved anywhere. So everybody's just um, making notes. Welcome to membership, PLS Carney. Okay. And yes, they are being tried together. They're in the courtroom together, Trezell and Jacqueline West. And if you missed the beginning, um, just check for all, you know, we went over all the charges they're facing, uh, tomorrow's closing arguments. That's why we're doing a full, full recap. Now that we can, with Letitia, Laurie out the way, my word. Now we're doing a full recap. So we are ready to see these two. <laughs> also, do you know, face the music. This is some photos from Bakersfield. They did live in Bakersfield back uh, prior to moving to Cal City. I can see them at the park. That's a family photo, all six kids. To the right, you can see them in their Halloween costume. Uh, these photos are from early 2020 and in 2019. They lived on Lotus Lane. They had an apartment there, apartment number 116. <laughs> Daniel says, the screen is backwards. It is indeed backwards. I was fiddling with the editor, and I thought it looked better from just watching the prosecution <laughs> this way, but some of the writing is backwards, yes. Sorry about that. They actually all lived there, all eight of them. And in the apartment to the other side of that same apartment building, they're in groups of um, eight apartments per uh, was Jacqueline's mother, Maria Martinez, who will be testifying in this case as well. Sometime in May, they opened escrow on a house in California City. And then in September, that escrow closed and they began to move uh, to California City. That is a photo of that residence uh, that they lived at, 10717 Aspen Way. You'll see a lot of photos of that home, body-worn camera of the inside of that home. Uh, you'll hear about uh, DNA tests, of bedding from that home, of diapers from that home, but that is the home of the West in California City. 
Also to the right, you can see that is their Chevy van. You'll see that in a lot of surveillance footage. Uh, you'll see that in photos from when crime scene analysts went through the vehicle. Now the case itself, just to kind of uh, help you understand the evidence and how it will proceed in this case, it'll start with December 21st and then move back. December 21st is the day that they reported Orrin and Orson were missing. And from there, that's when the police began their investigation and what they learned during that investigation and talking with the kids led them to move all the way back to September of 2020. But initially, when it was first reported by Trezell and Jacqueline was December 21st of 2020. Uh, that's the uh, initial call that was received that came in at 1741 hours. That translates to 541 uh, p.m. Officers were dispatched at 1746 or 546 p.m. They were on scene at 17. I'm just going to pause it for a second. Uh, Elspeth Sinclair says, forgive me for being naive or stupid. No, but why adopt two wee kids? They actually adopted four, and it's because they get $1,000 of uh, state benefits per child. So that was their primary income, unfortunately. That's very sad. 48, which is 548. The officers that responded were Lieutenant Hightower, uh, Officer Brian Hansen, Officer Anthony Cabriolis, Officer Joshua Flores from the California City Police Department. They all began to search uh, for Orrin and Orson. Um, So that, where they receive this information from Trezell, they show up on scene, they know they're looking for a three-year-old and a four-year-old. Now, just to give a sense of kind of what we're looking at, this is in the area of the home at 10717 California, or Aspen Avenue. The area he's speaking about playing in the backyard, you can see it here, and there is actually a fence uh, in the upper uh, northeast corner of that yard. And that'll become relevant as we go through this. Let me move this, I apologize. There's a fence in the upper northeast corner. That'll become relevant because that's where Trezell West is saying, Orrin and Orson, a three and a four year old, exited late that evening from a cement slab on the backyard. So police came, they began to search the home, they began to search the lot next to it, and there was no sign of Orrin and Orson. As I was saying, there is uh, camera footage from a house to the west. This is the footage, and you're going to see a lot of it. You're going to see hours of it. But this is the footage from the house that's at 10649 uh, Aspen Avenue. This is the west residence off to the east of the home. This is when police actually show up. That's Brian Hansen, and you can see uh, Jacqueline and Trezell as they come to approach. So that's the police, they come, they hear what they have to say, they begin to look for Orrin and Orson. They look in the neighborhood, they look in the house, they look in the yards next door, and there was no signs of them anywhere. They got assistance from local civilians. They got assistance from the Kern County Sheriff Department Search and Rescue. To the right of that slide, you can actually see the flight path that the CHP helicopter used as it did circles in the sky further and further away from the home, uh, looking for Orrin and Orson all the way into the desert. And there was no sight of them. There was agencies from all over that were assisting, people all over that were assisting. Um, they had to call CPS. This is from a CPS referral. Um, they. There's so many things going on, there's even miscommunication that go on. You'll see in this, and this will be evidence in this case, that there's mention that there is video footage of the two children walking down the street. There's no footage of them ever walking down the street. You'll hear from officers that combed for surveillance footage. At no point was any footage found that had Orrin and Orson walking down the street. The video I just talked about, the house to the west. Again, we're going to see a lot of it. See that there is no cars that drive up. No people that walk up to that home. Nobody that could come and abduct Orrin and Orson. And there is no footage showing them walking away from the home. California City Police, that when they were out there that night, they went to the neighbor. They tried to look through their surveillance footage. Uh, they went in the area looking for other people that had any camera footage. I just want to play this next portion. This is initially kind of the information they were getting from Trezell. Okay. You're right there in the corner. You're back facing yeah, yeah, yeah. You just want to wood in this area. I'll look for that. Okay. So there, you went there, you went over, and 
When did you go? Did you enter back from the fence? Yeah, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you, the last, like the last time you came in, did you try to lock it? No, the last time I was in, I was in the check to see that I had to move to the break from the five minutes out. Of course, it's again caught audio, which means it's not the best. I have tried my very best to boost it as much as possible for you. Um, but really, you could see you heard Trezell talking about the gate and it being unlocked and being left open and just a whole bunch of BS, okay? Okay. Now, what's going to become important in this case is details, things that are said and things that don't ring true based on the evidence in this case. You heard Trezell said that he left the gate open or closed it to the point where his dogs wouldn't get out. But then when he went out, the gate was open. Well, video pictures from that night, you can see when the first responding officers came, the gate was actually closed. They ultimately asked Trezell who closed the gate. He said, I didn't. Jacqueline did. They asked Jacqueline who closed the gate. She said, I didn't. He did. And again, they're starting to see inconsistencies in what they're saying, what Trezell is saying, what Jacqueline is saying. You'll see that in the evidence in this case. They also look at the gate itself because he said he closed it enough to where his dogs couldn't get out. But when he came out, it was open. So they tested that gate to see how hard it was to open. Now, go ahead. Again, these are three and four year old that are supposedly opening the gate. You just saw that it took a grown man some effort to even open. So again, they're noting inconsistencies in what Trezell is saying and what Jacqueline is saying to them. The cement slab, there was uh, with, uh, drawing with some chalk. They did see chalk on a cement slab, but Officer Hansen also noted that there was no children's footprints, anything consistent with children's footprints in the dirt. See, they say that they did see chalk on the cement slabs. I just don't know if it's like a piece of chalk or chalk drawings or what it is. I don't know if they just put it there. You know what I mean? Still so many questions about this chalk. But anyway, Amy says, thank you. Uh, thank you for your channel and dedicated coverage. Thank you so much, Amy. I really appreciate it. He did see footprints consistent with an adult, but nothing consistent with a child walking through the dirt that was between the cement slab and the gate that led out uh, to the field. They... This is just a kind of overview of the surveillance footage that they either viewed that night or were able to recover um, in the following days. Jesse Dobbins, he will be testifying in this case. He is, uh, lives across the street at the time. He had a Nest ca a camera on the front of his house. He didn't have the full uh, service with Nest, but he had a camera. And that camera uh, caught some activations that night. And this will become important as it relates to uh, the timing of it. There was an activation at 512 at 5.38 and at 5.51. Now, Mr. Dobbins, like I said, lives directly across the street from the West residence. And so his Nest camera looks out across the street, somewhat to the yard to the right, but a lot of the house of the West. You will see based on the surveillance footage that 5.12 is consistent with the time that Trezell was out getting wood from the yard next to it. 5.38 is consistent with the time frame of when Trezell returned from searching for the kids. 5.51, is consistent when law enforcement arrived on scene. There is no activation for any other movement based on what Jesse Dobbins will testify to. Uh, the house that is to the west, again, this is 10649. Put a circle around it, but this is that evening. You'll have to do math when, when we go through it, but it's 57 minutes slow. So this is at approximately um, 509. And you'll see this up in the corner. This is the area with the fence. I'll use my that area, you can see an individual pulling items in and out of the yard through the fence. So Trezell West was outside pulling wood in and out. He was in fact pulling wood in and out. That's his story sticking to it. Uh, Wayne said, drawing on the street with chalk is a thing. It's a big thing, especially here in the Netherlands. Oh my word. The kids do it a lot here. <laughs> um, and Nadrian Markowski, Markowski said, I called and told the authorities where I thought the bodies could be found. Are you able to share what you think that is or no? Through the fence. At some time around 16, 20 hours or 5, 17 p.m. in real time, 
That's the last time when Trezell went into the house. That's the time frame he said that he last saw the children. When he returned a short time later, they were gone. That's where you're going to hear uh, Mr. West say in this case. For approximately 10 minutes in the hall, you will see that he enters his van and begins to drive around the area. At about six minutes later, he returns from driving, goes in the house, and that's when the call is made that you heard earlier. It's also footage from a neighbor that lived to the northeast area on Rome Beauty Drive. Mr. Robert Avalar, he will be testifying in this case. That's footage from his home. It looks out towards the desert area, which is near the Aspen end of Aspen Avenue. He said that evening, you can see a picture of him to the left. This is Mr. Avalar here. Uh, he was outside. He did not see any children walking into the desert. It's also footage that was recovered from 108th Street. It's a white rectangle where, uh, showing the coverage of a ring camera. That's Mr. Trezell West's van driving around the neighborhood. Now again, it's the inconsistencies which lead the officers to investigate, which keeps them talking to uh, Jacqueline and Trezell West. They search the backyard. This is another look of the... Uh... Don't pause here and there. Martin says, why is chalk important? Because of their BS story, when they talk to the media, three months after the boys are already believed to have been murdered. And I see there's still theories, you know, and there could be theories, okay? There's theories that people say, what if they were sold or what if, you know? But investigators, investigators have said, based on evidence, they believe they were murdered between September 1st and September 11th. And so anyway, Martin, why is chalk important? Because Trezell kept on saying, uh, Oren and Orson, so Syrian classic, were outside playing with chalk. And he was just collecting firewood. He didn't realize then the gate was left open and that they just went outside. So in the initial stages of the case, a lot of people focus on the chalk, you know, like, what is it? Is chalk the dog? No, that's not the dog's name now. Okay. So what does it mean? Were they actually, because the boys were never there. So it could have been chalk for the other kids. They had six kids in total, two of their own and four adopted kids. But yeah, just, it's just... <laughs> It's terrible to think that they said, no, they never went to play outside, but yet they may have, some of the other kids may have had the chalk outside. So that's why. It's not actually a big deal, but people were very busy with that because of what Trezell said, just so that you know. Buttercup, thank you so much. And for those asking, I do put on the screen here, um, prosecution opening statements. So this is not the defense. This is the prosecution's opening statements from March 28, 2023. I'm going to play it again now. And then we're going to look at the 17 days of trial bullet points. After that, I'll play the defense's opening statements. Okay? So that's what we're doing. Backyard facing the home. And based on some statements uh, by Jacqueline, they actually take a cadaver dog out into the backyard. And you can see the dog there. That's Sadie. She does note that there is something there, but what her handler says is, says is it was confused interest. But nonetheless, based on what Jacqueline said to them, a cadaver dog was taken out there and had some notification based on uh, what that dog smelled. Now, the FBI went and went through that yard, went through the dirt, dug, all those things. No bones were ever found. No body parts were ever found. But the dog did alert or have confused, confused interest at that location. And we will look at more of that in those bullet points. This is the opening statements. We're going to deep dive a lot of what was said in the trial. View Galaxy says, isn't this band being streamed? Okay, so if you missed the beginning, welcome to the stream. So it is not legal to stream the audio from the court, especially, I mean, people broke that rule. The, the judge was very strict. You can listen in, but you may not stream it. And so that was shut down real quick. Um, and so the thing is this, the opening statements happened on March 28, 2023 for the prosecution. And only now, five days ago, has the media been able to share the opening statements. So they shared the prosecution's opening statements and the defense's opening statements. That's now available for public viewing. There were cameras in the courtroom that day. For the rest of the trial, it's just been when you can, when you can listen to the audio, you make notes and that's that. You may not record it. You may not broadcast it. You may not do any of that. Tomorrow is closing arguments. Now, what truly began the investigation, you'll hear this through Officer Hansen and also uh, the other four children of Jacqueline and Trezell, when they were spoken to the early morning hours of December 22nd, 2020, it's what they said that led to the investigation. 
Uh, to your left, that's Adrian. That's the oldest biological son of Jack. Sorry, this is um, flipped now, okay? So to the left would be on the right-hand side now. Uh, Sassy said they get more dollars for siblings. I remember you saying that earlier as well. Yes. Glenn and Trezell, he was 10 at the time. He was asked specifically about December 19th, because that's when they had gone to Wanda West's house, the grandmother's house. They were not home the evening that Jacqueline and Trezell reported Orrin and Orson missing. They were actually in Bakersfield visiting family members. So they were asked, were Orrin and Orson with you when you came to Wanda West's house in Bakersfield December 19th? Adrian said no. He was interviewed multiple times. You'll hear this through a, a Sonia Barton and also Adrian, that his mother had told him that Orson and Orrin were over at his grandmother's, or Maria Martinez. He told them that Orrin and Orson had left before September that they went to grandmother's house a couple days after we moved to California City. So again, they're getting a sense of not only were they not in the van on December 19th, that they hadn't been in the home in California City also. To the right, that is Aiden, another biological son of Jacqueline and Trezell. He was asked who was in the car on the trip to Bakersfield December 19th. He said his brothers. And you'll hear evidence when that was clarified by brothers, who do you mean? Devin, Damian, and Adrian. Again, this is Aiden stating that Orrin and Orson were not in the vehicle on that trip, December 19th. He was um, we are going to go through more details. Happy birthday to Rainy Days. Thank you for being here with us. Really appreciate that you're spending some of your birthday here with us. And yes, um, Ryan, the information has been very hard to come by. It's been very hard to follow this story. But I must say, Veronica Morley on Twitter, she's been tweeting out every day minute by minute of the audio when the the court proceedings are uh, happening. So that's been really nice as well to see. I was asked why Orrin and Orson didn't move to the house. And evidence will show in this case, he said, because they cry a lot. And that his mom and dad said they went to the place where they used to live. Again, the investigators are hearing this from not just one, but two children now. That they were not in the home in California City and that they had been taken somewhere else. Moving on to Damien and Devin. Damien, very young at the time, but he was asked, did they move to the house? He said yes, but then they left. They were there only a little day, only one day. So again, Orrin and Orson were at California City, but only for one day, and then they were gone. So at this point, there's three children. of Jacqueline and Trezell saying that Orrin and Orson... I just want to be careful showing all these uh, children's faces. Sorry, I should have blocked it out before, so I'm just going to continue to play the audio. You can hear it still, right? Orson were at California City only for a short period of time, or not at all. Moving on to Devin. He was asked, when's the last time he saw Orrin and Orson? He said, at the apartment. Again, the apartment's in Bakersfield, not in California City. Asked if Orrin had gone somewhere else, he said, Orrin went somewhere else, he went to mom's grandma. So again, four children of Jacqueline and Trezell, all four said that they were not with them when they went December 19th, and they hadn't even been with them in California City. This is a Facebook post uh, that you will see related to Jacqueline West. This is um, the day after, I'll go back, the day after these interviews of the four boys. The next day, or that same day, they were informed essentially what um, Adrian, Aiden, Devin, and Damian had said, and this is a, a message that she sent to Wanda West, who had contact with the boys. Jacqueline said, please tell them we love them and miss them. And she also said, the boys need to ask for a lawyer if they want to talk to them again. I don't want them twisting whatever they are saying. So the officers take that information September 19th. They begin to look through the footage. They begin to look at that van to see, can we see if any kids are getting in? Can we see if four are getting in? Can we see if six are getting in? What can we see? That's footage, kind of a screenshot of the footage from the home. You can see on December 19th at 1135, plus 57 minutes, that's when people enter that van and drive to Bakersfield. Ultimately, the question will be up for you as jurors, how many children entered that van that day? Return time, 1544 or 344, plus 57 minutes. Again, that's the return of Jacqueline and Trezell to the home that day. The total trip time was five hours and nine minutes. Now, you'll hear testimony about that trip, where they went. They went to a home on Potomac, 1109 Potomac. That's Wanda and Philip West's home. And from there, they went to Strata Credit Union, which is on Truxton and South H Street. They then took Wanda home because she had gone with them to Strata. They went to a gas station and to Superior Grocers before they went home. 
So that's just kind of a list of all the places they went. At none of those places, on any of the surveillance footage, were Orrin and Orson ever seen. You'll hear from Wanda. She'll say she didn't hear the kids in the car. She didn't see them. She didn't necessarily look for them, but she didn't see them in the car. So Wanda West, who got in at the home at 1109 Potomac, all the way to Strata Credit Union, all the way back at no point being in the car. Did she hear Orrin? Did she hear Orson? Or did she see any evidence of them in the car? This is that van. I circled it going to Strata Credit Union. Again, trucks in South H. This is Jacqueline and Trezell at the Gasco. That's at East California and Mount Vernon. Again, no sign of the children. December 19th, this is Superior Grocers. That's on Union and East California. I circled that Chevy van. It's quite uh, recognizable, the van itself. We'll watch the video from that. It's there for about 20 minutes. At no point does Orrin and Orson ever exit that van, or are they seen? Now, moving forward to December 28th. At that point, the oldest son of Jacqueline and Trezell is re-interviewed by Sonia Barton. Uh, who is Sonia Barton? She works for a CPS. She's not a law enforcement officer. She interviews children. That's what she does. But on that date, she speaks to Adrian. That's a screenshot of him there sitting on the couch. December 28th of 2020. On that date, he, heard, he told Sonia Barton that while they were still living at the apartment in Bakersfield, he heard noises in the night coming from Orson or Orrin. The first person to find Orrin in the morning was his parents. What he saw was Orrin. His color was fading. There was throw up coming out of his nose. And ultimately... Okay, trigger warning for that. He died at the apartment there on Baker's, in Lotus Lane in Bakersfield. He told uh, Sonia Barton and also later in his testimony that Trezell and Jacqueline did not call for any medical care for Orrin. Uh, Trezell went to grab something that looked like some form of medical device, maybe a stethoscope, but ultimately they didn't discuss getting medical care for Orrin. They let him die. What they did is they discussed keeping it a secret. Uh, Adrian, both in his interview and ultimately in later testimony, they asked him, that being Jacqueline and Trezell, if they should tell somebody or keep it a secret. And what you'll hear testimony is through Adrian is that he knew if they told somebody, they would be taken away from their parents. Now, as for Orson, again, this is based on uh, what you'll hear in evidence in this case on Adrian's prior statement and testimony. Orson was in California City for about four days. At some point, Adrian heard a loud thud in the night. The day prior to hearing the thud, Orson was there. The day after the loud thud, Orson was gone, and he hasn't seen him since. He believed that Orson was taken back to his grandma's. Now, again, the time frame of that interview with Sonia Barton, that's December 28th. This is a call that was heard between um, Jacqueline, Trezell, and Adrian about one week later. Look, I just want you to know, you don't have to talk to anybody if you don't want to, okay? I don't want nobody to tell you what to say, nothing like that. No. You don't have to talk to nobody. I know the same thing, asking me a lot of questions, but if you don't want to talk to me, you don't have to be. And as I said before, those four boys will be coming in to testify in this case. But that's their mother, Adrian's mother, about one week after he told them, the police, what had happened at the apartment in Bakersfield, trying to get him uh, not to talk. Now, again, based on the information that they received, the officers began to go back and see if they can interview anyone that did see Orrin or Orson. They talked to the realtor, uh, Robert Dees. He had gone out there um, prior to the West moving. He remembers seeing five children. He also specifically remembers four boys playing and one boy was mad, kind of with his arms crossed. He ultimately identified Orson as being there, but he only saw five children at California City. Now, the pest control individual, Joseph Karsham Room, he recalled six to seven when he went in the home September 15th, but ultimately when they went out to the Chevy van because he wanted to spray the house, he saw three to four children walking out and one being carried out. Again, the math on that is five children. Maria Martinez, she was asked about whether or not she had seen Orrin and Orson from the date of moving to December 21st. When she was first interviewed, she didn't even know the names of Orrin and Orson. She said that she did not watch Orrin or Orson from September forward. And also, she uh, told them about the time that she had visited October 10th and also some video calls. But she, when she was pressed on it, she ultimately says, I think they were there. 
I believe they were there. I can't be 100% sure because right there, I didn't see them. I didn't see their faces. They also asked the sister, Perla Martinez, and ultimately what she said through testimony is, and you'll hear her testimony in this case, she did have some video calls, but the camera moved around and she didn't really know who she was looking at or who was who. She does remember seeing Aiden specifically, but that's all she remembers. So again, the police are trying to develop at any point, has anyone seen Orrin and Orson? I'm gonna go through the timeline, the specific timeline of the move to California City. September 11th, that's when they got the keys from the realtor, uh, Robert Dees. September 15th, that's when the pest control individual first named Joseph went to the house. September 17th, 2020, they went out to Cal City. And then I highlighted this date because it's gonna become important in this case, September 18th, 2020. That's the day that Wanda West went out to Cal City to watch the boys so that Trezell and Jacqueline could move. Well, when she went out to California City to watch the boys, that did not include Orrin and Orson. That was only Adrian, Aiden, Devin, and Damien. September 18th, that's when Jacqueline and Trezell drive from California City to Bakersfield to pick up a U-Haul. Wanda West stays with the four boys. Again, Adrian, Aiden, Devin, and Damien. She had no sight of Orrin and Orson. She believed that they were at the grandmother's Maria Martinez in Bakersfield. And again, Maria Martinez will testify she did not watch Orrin and Orson. September 18th, they return. This is the U-Haul that they return in. The van itself stays in Bakersfield. Jacqueline and Trezell return to California City in this van. You'll hear testimony that it's a two-seater. There is no space for children. There is no space for Orrin and Orson. There will be a cell phone footage in this case, kind of give a sense of the trips back and forth. Because it becomes important, their trips back and forth, because Wanda West helps them unload the vehicle, the U-Haul, helps them uh, watch the kids, takes Trezell to McDonald's, so does these things, and at no point does she see Orrin and Orson over the weekend of the 18th to the 20th. During that weekend, Trezell and Jacqueline are back and forth to Bakersfield in the U-Haul, picking up items. And again, Wanda West believes that Orrin and Orson are at Maria Martinez. There's going to be a lot of video in this case, but listen to the video specific to what Jacqueline says about where Orrin and Orson are when they're moving. She says that Orrin and Orson are with her when they're moving. This is just showing some more back and forth between Bakersfield and California City. Ultimately, again, September 19th and 20th, Wanda and the four boys help Trezell unload the U-Haul. Again, no sight of Orrin or Orson. On September 20th, Trezell and Wanda return the U-Haul in California City. On September 20th, again, Trezell and Wanda come back to the house. Jacqueline, Trezell, Wanda, the four boys are all there. They hang out for a while. At no point is Orrin and Orson present. On that same day, Trezell and Wanda drive back to the apartments on Lotus Lane. Once they get there, Trezell gets in the van, drives out, gets on the freeway, and goes home. Again, at no point during this time are Orrin and Orson seen. You'll see through the evidence in this case that lines up directly with what Adrian said, the timeline when Orrin and Orson went missing. July 25th, 2020, this is a photo of Orrin West. This is the last known photo ever taken of Orrin. It's recovered from the cell phones that were seized in this case. This is the last known photo of Orson taken in the apartment at Lotus Lane. July 25th, 2020. Now during one of the interviews, and it'll be played for you here, Jacqueline West talks about how she talked to her kids about Orrin and Orson. She said, I told them, pretend they're not here. Just act like they don't live here. Just uh, go do your work. She talked about what she did with Orrin and Orson. I always keep them separated. I keep them separated. I focus mainly on schooling while they're playing. They don't really play together. But they have played together. I just don't know. But that's essentially what happened to Orrin and Orson. They were in that home, but they were kept separate. And then ultimately, sometime in September, they were killed and have not been seen since then. Uh, during, I've spoke about it, well, there'll be a lot of surveillance footage we look at. There'll be a lot of interviews that we look at. Interviews of Jacqueline, interviews of Trezell. A lot of details that we will be going over. Things that they said, things that changed. And ultimately, the answer to the question of where are the boys will be answered, it's that they're dead. 
And at the end of the case, I will ask you to return a verdict of guilty beyond a reasonable doubt as to Trezell and Jacqueline for the murders of Orrin and Orson West. Thank you. Let's start this. Okay, so that was the prosecution's opening statement. So now what we're going to do is recap the entire trial with bullet points that we have here. I'm quickly going to go back to here just so that if you just join the stream now, Sincere and Classic Pettis, that's their real names. That's what they were born as, Sincere and Classic. They were reported missing by adoptive parents on December 21st, 2020 from Bakersfield. Um, they were reported missing in Cal City, California. Prosecutors say they died three months before they reported missing and their bodies have never been found. Their adoptive parents, Trezell and Jacqueline West, are on trial for their murders. They are known in the media as Oren and Orson West, which are their adoptive names. Trezell and Jacqueline West were arrested March 1st, 2022. They face two counts of second degree murder each, right? Two counts of child cruelty, falsely reporting an emergency, involuntary manslaughter, and conspiracy. If you're only joining now, we did, I'll timestamp everything as I always do, but we did look at their entire interview together already, as well as the prosecution's opening statements that happened on March 28th, 2023. And no, it wasn't allowed to be broadcast at the time, but now, that was from March 28th, now we're already mid-May. They've now been able to share uh, the news stations, mainstream media has shared the prosecution's opening statements and the defenses. So we will watch the defenses as well. The defense, um, their opening statements happened on day 18 of the trial, which is why I'm first showing you now the prosecution's opening statements. Now we're going to go over the all the bullet points from day one all the way up to day 17. The prosecution then rested their case. Day 18, 19, and 20, the defense had the opening statements and they presented their case and then rested their case. And now... Tomorrow, there should be uh, closing arguments. And then, can't wait. Can't wait for the next step. So the West trial, Trezell and Jacqueline West are charged with second-degree murder, involuntary manslaughter, and other offenses, and face life terms in prison if convicted. They are being tried together. They had two other adoptive children and two biological children when Sincere and Classic went missing. The bodies of Sincere and Classic, known as Orrin and Orson, in the media have not been found, despite massive searches involving hundreds of people and an investigation that brought in multiple agencies, including the FBI. There's been a gag order on the case, so many new details have been revealed in this trial, which started on March 28, 2023. Witnesses who are minors have been called to the stand. The trial has not been available to view publicly. Cameras were allowed during the opening statements, but the rest of the trial has been audio only and you got to catch it when it's happening you cannot stream it you cannot broadcast it it's not archived or anything like that anna green thank you so much you say bakersfield is only 45 miles from me wow okay and thank you so much for that Closing arguments are anticipated to take place tomorrow tuesday may 16 2023 the state and the defense have rested their case the judge is charles R. bremer Charles R. Bremer, Prosecutor Eric Smith, Defense Timothy Hennessy, Alexia Torres, Stallings, and Fatima Rodriguez. There's another defense attorney whose name I didn't put in here. Sorry about that. But each, Trizel has got two defense attorneys. Jacqueline's got two, apparently, as well. So there's that. And uh, the case against the West is built on circumstantial evidence. So because they haven't found the bodies yet, they do say investigators believe that they were murdered between September 1st and 11th. However, they haven't found their bodies, so I'm not too sure exactly what that evidence is. I always fear that it's digital. I really worry about that. But, um, yeah, the case is sad and scary enough as it is. This is uh, pictures from the West family, 2019, early 2020. The family of eight lived at 1525 Lotus Lane, number 116, Bakersfield, California. Sincere and Classic were adopted by Trezell and Jacqueline in 2018. We did some map time as well. So now day one and two, we just saw the opening statements that took place on Tuesday, March 28, 2023. The prosecutor, Eric Smith, accuses the West of planning out the deaths of Orrin and Orson with an unknown co-conspirator who then killed the boys. The defense argues that Jacqueline and Trezell are simply the parents of two missing children being punished by California City for being different. The first witness was a 911 dispatcher who took Trezell's call when he reported the boys missing on December 21, 2020 in Cal City, California. The second witness was Officer Joshua Flores. I'm reading a bit fast now because we went over this before. Okay, it's a recap. 
Body cam show Trezell saying that he may have left the gate open by mistake. Jacqueline tells officers the boys had to have left through the backyard. On day two, Cal City PD Brian Henson said there was no sign of the boys at the Cal City home and in the neighborhood. There were no footprints. There were no dirty diapers or anything like that. Body cam was shown and Trezell's interrogation was shown uh, involving an FBI agent and the Cal City PD officers. Trezell was asked what his theory was of what happened to the boys. And he said he thought the boys left through the gates and he doesn't then know what happened to them. So, wow, that's a really easy story to stick to. I don't know. Left the gate open and I don't know what happened. So, Cal City PD on day three, Officer Brian Hansen was back on the stand and neighbors of Trezell and Jacqueline were also on the stand. And some witnesses have actually testified via Zoom as well. So the other children told officers that they hadn't heard Oren and Orson cry. Neighbor Jesse Dobbins said he went to borrow an air compressor and noticed four children at the home. Robin Plants, I know here in the opening statements they said one of them that was the real estate agent noticed five. So there's different accounts, lots of kids running around. Some people are like this, four of them. Some people are like five, some people are seven. But anyway, carry on. Robert Plants, a neighbor, saw an African-American man with a gray hoodie in the yard on the day the boys went missing. He was going back and forth in the yard with wood and eventually got into a white van. The trial then went on hold for a week due to spring break and they returned on April the 10th. Now I'm going to say, please note that this is um, as much as I was able to recap now. I mean, there's so much. There is so much. And I would highly recommend if you want to listen to like really extensive uh, recaps. You go here. Okay, I'm going to link this afterwards. This lady's channel, Lawyer Mystery Maven. Um, it's absolutely brilliant how she's made notes of everything, like by listening every day to the trial and making notes far more extensive than the bullet points I've got here. For me, for me what I did for you guys here is pick out the... I don't want to say highlights. It's a terrible case. But you know what I mean? Like the highlights from the trial days of like, okay, this is important to share and this and this. So it's not all the bullet points, but it's all the main ones. Hope that makes sense. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nasser. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie Chen. I really appreciate it. So day four, there were seven witnesses, including the realtor that helped Rizal and Jacqueline buy the house in California City, the lender, a pest control man, a nearby resident, a CHP flight officer, and two California City police officers. Now, Robert Dees, the realtor, gave Trezell and Jacqueline the keys to their home in Cal City on September 11th, 2020. So you could see that if they think the boys were murdered sometime between September 1st and 11th, and maybe uh, one of the boys did make it there for a day or maybe four days. It's interesting timing, though, isn't it, that <laughs> they're going there right around that time to... Move to a new house. I mean, they do say flight is a sign of guilt, right? So they're like, ooh, okay, new start, new house. And Broom says, Grizzly to Crime, this is an awesome recap of a huge amount of material. So much work, so well done. Thank you, much appreciated. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anne. I'm glad you recognize because, oh my word, it's a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. So Robert Dees gave Trezell and Jacqueline the keys to their home. A picture there. Okay. Um... So on September 11, 2020, and noticed a boy on the patio with a mean look on his face. Okay, he identified him as Orson. He did not see Oren, but he did see the other four kids. So it's believed that um, Orson was killed shortly after this, if he even made it there. Some people speculate he didn't even make it there, but some say he made it there for about a day, maybe max four days. All right. Pest control saw four or five kids at the home. They treated the home for ants or spiders. And yeah, the West's uh, primary source of income was from the adoptions of four kids. And apparently you get a little bit more if you adopt siblings. So that really sucks as well. Man, I feel so terrible for these kids. Day five was on April 11, 2023. A Cal City uh, PD officer, Jesse Hightower, was on the stand for most of the day, noted that when speaking to Jacqueline, when the boys were reported missing, she did not show any anxiety or frustration or anger. It's much like Letitia. We all, that's all fresh in our minds. If you did watch that entire trial with me, 
it sounds like watching those because <laughs> of course it was audio only so you can't see the videos but it sounds like that we're like huh you're not showing a lot of anxiety or frustration or anger huh now hightower found a firearm in the house and it was on body cam they said they heard him saying hide it and he placed it under a blanket in the top bunk of a bunk bed so i'm just noting that okay Trezell told officers that he thought the boy's biological parents took them. You see? It's like Letitia. A standard criminal 101 where they're like, okay, okay, how will we deflect? First, let's wait three months in this case, and then let's blame the biological parents. Yes, okay, he said he heard a rumor, and it scared him because the other boys were in the house. Okay. Uh, Maria Martinez, and you guys, I had to be very careful not to write Sanchez, okay? I'm going to read this comment out. Cha-Cha said, when two children are murdered from the same family on different days, they always seem to murder the older one first. Knowing the older one would ask too many questions. Same with Tylee and JJ. That's true as well, Cha-Cha. Yes, that's true as well. Let me just see if I can put this banner on. If, yeah, that's cool. That could stay there while I do this. Okay. So, yes, he was trying to blame the biological parents. Like, they were trying to take them. No, yeah, Maria Martinez, I had to not write Mar Maria Sanchez, okay. Maria Martinez is Jacqueline's um, biological mother, and she took the stand. She said she lived in the same apartment complex as Jacqueline Trezell and the six kids, and she had also fostered children in the past. So at some point, Jacqueline said something like, was inspired by, she could have been inspired by her mother to foster kids and adopt kids and for Jacqueline though it was very much about financial gain it seems all right she did um uh, she did know the names of the four adopted children I, I think I meant to write did not she didn't know the names <laughs> of the four adopted children and hardly visited or babysat any of the kids like so they've got a bit of a distant relationship huh? she didn't know that's a typo didn't know the names of the four adopted kids Hardly visited or babysat any of the kids. Maria says she did not know that they were moving to Cal City until they did. So, odd relationship that. Um, meaning, <laughs> so everybody believes for a time that, you know, when the boys went missing, oh no, they with Maria. But Maria doesn't even know their names. Wow, yes. Thank you for sharing the yellow hearts and blue hearts. I'm actually not sure what the official... Uh, favorite colors are that they're sharing one thing but I just you know when I see this picture I'm like oh man so I've been sharing yellow hearts and blue hearts too thank you so much uh, Becky G okay day six and seven of the trial Maria Martinez was back on the stand that's Jacqueline's mother she says she visited the Cal City home in October to give them plants Jacqueline came outside Maria didn't go inside the home and she didn't see any of the kids that day Again, it's a very strange relationship. I'm really trying not to judge, but like, damn, it just sounds like she's obviously very polite. Okay, very polite. But Jacqueline's just like, no, 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 you just wait outside. It's quite a drive, though. You're going there with plants, and then you just have to wait outside. You can't go in the home. It's a bit odd. One would think if she's her mother, I don't know, she's bringing her plants. Like, let me carry it inside. Let me see where you're going to live. But it doesn't seem like that that was happening, right? Um, someone asked where um, Groovy Tuesday said, I wonder why they chose that day to report the kids missing. There was rumor initially that they said maybe because they realized, oh man, Christmas is around the corner. People are going to realize they're missing, you know? So Jacqueline apparently never showed her pictures of the kids on Facebook or on calls, and she thought it was weird. I think she had a translator. Maria, this Maria actually speaks Spanish. December 2020, around the 5th, Trezell actually dropped, uh, dropped Jacqueline off at her mother's apartment for a few hours to celebrate Jacqueline's birthday. Maria didn't go outside, didn't see the kids. Jacqueline told her the kids were with Trezell's mom. Later that day, Trezell had tried to load some wooden planks, later set a shelf, into the van, but they didn't fit. Maria recalls visiting the Cal City home twice, and she says she saw Aaron and Orson. But before, she says she doesn't even know their names. <laughs> okay, but she says she saw them. She says they were in the living room. Reminder, yes, yeah, she didn't know the names of any of the adopted kids. So I don't know, maybe she just saw kids in the living room. Probably not them, though. 
especially because one definitely didn't make it there and the other only maybe for a day or four. Okay, so she, yeah, October, no, she definitely <laughs> didn't see them there. She's like, oh, yeah, I saw them. They were in the lounge. No, 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 no. Those are the other kids. She said she saw them last on October 10th, 2020. August, September, October. No, nope, not possible at the, Cal, at the Cal City home. She said she saw all six children there. Again, not possible. <laughs> it's not possible. Jane Lowe says, what was the motive? No one really knows, but they sound extremely abusive. So, yeah, trigger warning for upcoming content as I break down this trial as best I can for you guys. Maria's kids uh, were also checked for bruises or signs of abuse just in case. It seemed like Maria and Jacqueline lived very different and separate lives. Maria is Jacqueline's mother. Latoya Spry Sanders took the stand. Man, that sounded hectic, you guys. This was a very emotional testimony from the sounds of it. She fostered Sincere and Classic for about a year and said she loved them as if they were her own. When she fostered them from when Sincere was four months old and Classic was 11 months old. It was a very emotional testimony and jurors were apparently crying during her testimony, which I think is good. Okay. They will remember that when it comes to deliberation. Uh, Sincere Oren needed extra care because of an injury to his leg. She said the boys were removed from her home after an unfounded accusation regarding her biological daughter. So apparently her biological daughter went to school. There was a scrape on her leg and someone called CPS just to check on her and check the scrape. And because she was fostering these kids, they immediately took away the foster kids and her daughter, apparently. So that was around March 9th, 2018. And then Bakersfield PD Detective John Ryan, who also worked for the FBI, he said he was called on December 22nd, 2020. So that's a day after they reported the boys missing. He was asked to assist with the missing boys case. He went door to door to get leads. He spoke to Trezell to get a baseline and to try to establish what had happened. Video evidence was then presented Jacqueline wasn't sure of the boy's birth date. So I'm just noting the important things I say again. It's not everything. I'm noting the important things. Jacqueline had no idea. Like, what are their birthdays again? I don't know, man. Like, she didn't care. She wasn't sure how long the boys were outside before Trezell came back inside. So she's just playing dumb, pretty much. <laughs> Trying to hide what she really knows, right? She said that they're... The other four kids were with her mother-in-law, Wanda West. So this is one of those <laughs> where between Trezell and Jacqueline, they're both pointing at each other's mothers and like, oh, those other kids, yeah, they were them. But apparently I think the four kids actually were at that time with Wanda West, Trezell's mother. She had them, we're going to go over that somewhere here, from, I think it was from December 19th and she was supposed to have them until New Year's. Which just shows also how calculated Trezell and Jacqueline were because they're like, okay, you you take care of the kids. We're going to be in Cal City. We're going to do some media interviews. It's time to report they're missing. But then <laughs> also just say, oh, my word, like the two, they were here, the other four over there, which also doesn't make all that much sense. And they just walked out the gate. I'm like, wow, okay. She said Orin and Orson were stubborn. I don't like the way they describe the kids. Of course not. These are... Um, charged killers you know alleged killers uh yeah so they're saying rambunctious and now they're saying they were stubborn they like to run around that the gate was open because trizel was collecting firewood said that all four adopted children were adopted on the same day in april 2020 but ugh, no april 2020 no it was in 2018 so the thing is they had six children in total i'm saying no because she said a bunch of crap like all four were adopted on the same day but we also previously adopted the other two they had four adopted kids, two biological kids, and I think they adopted Sincere and Classic in 2018. So maybe the other two, April 2020. Six children in total. Her mother got her interested in fostering and adopting. So there that is. So why the move then to Cal City? You know what her answer was? She said to get away from everybody. <laughs> okay, to, to get away from everybody, especially the boy's biological family. Oh, because they were actually worried, right? visitation wasn't happening anymore they literally ran off they thought they just ran off and blocked them and didn't want them to see their kids anymore but meanwhile unfortunately they were no longer with us 
according to what investigators say, right? So when the officer says, um, the officer says, you know, kids are sometimes trafficked or sold. Jacqueline says, it wasn't like that, which is such a weird answer. Like, no, it wasn't like that. Okay, then what was it like? What was it like? <laughs> it wasn't like that. One would think she'd be like, oh my word, what? Trafficked or sold? No. Yes. You know, it would be more shocking. And she's just like, nah, it wasn't like that. Oh, wow. Okay. So they got $1,000 in adoption checks from the state per adopted child. And as someone said in the chat earlier, they might even have gotten a bit more for siblings. She said they dropped off the kids at, uh, this is the from the video, by the way. This is, a, this is not uh, Jacqueline on the stand. This is from hearing the video footage that was played, right? She dropped the kids off at Wonders House on Saturday, December 19, 2020. She said her mother wasn't really involved in their life, that they had a distant relationship. She said the boys didn't go out to play often because it was just dirt. She said the boys didn't like to talk on the phone and they took no naps that day. The day, she says, they went missing, which she is still in her head saying December 21st, 2020. She didn't know where the boys would have gone. She noticed other kids playing, but she didn't think to go out there and talk to those other kids and say, hey, did you see anything? <laughs> Just like, damn, like red flags everywhere, of course. Um, so she said police told them to stay home, even though they wanted to keep looking, which we also saw in that interview. The officer told her that all four kids told her, oh, sorry, the officer told her that all four kids had told him or told them that uh, they hadn't seen Orin or Orson or since CN Classic since September. 2020. Of course, she explains that away as well. Ugh, they've got wild imaginations. Like, what the heck, man? She said she thinks someone took the boys. She said the other four children don't get along with Orin and Orson. What? She said they are just little kids. They will say anything. <laughs> so if all four other kids are being interviewed, it must be so stressful, but separately, and they're all like, yeah, we haven't seen um, Sincero Classic, which they knew as Orin or Orson since September. She's like, yeah, just little kids, they'll say anything. Trizel's youngest brother, Josiah West, took the stand and said he did not see the boys at any point after the family moved to Cal City. So even he was like, I don't see them. Like, Cal like you know, in um, Bakersfield, yes. But after they'd moved to Cal City, nope, didn't see the boys. He said one of the bio kids had an arm injury and didn't talk much. So I wrote that because it's quite a red flag if you hear, even though they say the other adopted kids say the bio kids were treated much better and they had more stuff than them. Ah, there's still red flags there of, you know, not being verbal at all, just crying and having injuries and things like that. that that's quite um, a concern. Yes. <laughs> I'm not too painting victim shaming. Wow. I know, right? It's so original of these criminals. Yes. Okay. So she, here we go again. Yeah, with the victim. She, she, he said that, um, the brother, sorry, the, the brother said, Oren did not speak. He was not an experienced talker. Well, he's just reporting the facts here, right? He was not an experienced talker. He mostly cried, made noises, stuttered, or mumbled, which I don't know, just based on the bit I know about... Cases like this, I think that would be a, that's a bit of a red flag, that. <laughs> Shame. He referred to Orin and Orson as heavy criers and said they were like twins and said the home looked like a military garrison. Like beds really low, very minimalist would be a nice way to describe this. They say very military, very disciplined, very, you know, not child friendly, put it that way. Now, Charles Pettis, the father of the two boys, the biological father of the two boys, he testified. He was asked if he himself kidnapped the boys, and he said no. There was video interrogation shown um, of Jacqueline West from December 22nd, 2020. Ishel Hill, I hope I'm saying that right, Ishel Hill, CPS, testified that there were no photographs of the children in the house. And it was really hard to find recent photographs of the boys, too. So on day eight of the trial, Trezell's father, Philip West, a former Marine, which of course the defense went there. <laughs> they were like, he's a former Marine. He's the one that taught Trezell how to have this military type boot camp house. 
It's all his fault. <laughs> good one, defense. Good one, I would. <laughs> I mean, they got to do something, right? But anyway, Trizel's father, Philip West, a former Marine, said he had also not seen Oren and Orson since the family moved to Cal City. So that's now a second person saying that. Philip said he was still mind boggled by the situation. More video footage was shown. Jacqueline only cried when the officer told her that all four children were in the care of CPS. I could probably bet that if they said the two adopted kids, they were CPS, your two kids are with your mom, she probably wouldn't have cried, right? Well, we never know. But she apparently only cried then. Officer John Ryan said that all four kids said that they had not seen the boys since September. So again, he said that. Surveillance of the van showed only four kids with Trezell and Jacqueline. He said, you got new phones. You're covering up. She said, we didn't want the bio family calling us. We didn't want them to know our numbers. That's what Officer Ryan said when he testified. Brenda says, how were they ad allowed to adopt children? Yeah, the system, it's pretty pucked, right? <laughs> I'm not T-Pain says, let's just pass the blame to everyone except the people responsible. <laughs> yes. And says, per Google, in California, second-degree murder is the killing of another person that is willful but not deliberate or premeditated, i.e. an intentional act that wasn't planned ahead of time. Interesting. Okay, so day nine, cross-examination of Officer John Ryan. <laughs> the defense grilled him for his investigative technique, saying it was too harsh, that he was threatening uh, Jacqueline, saying, you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose your kids. Uh, what did you do? And they just said it was a bit too harsh. Uh, there was a radar device used uh, to search the West backyard. They found nothing significant. There was a dog that was trained to detect human remains that actually alerted um, at a mound in the yard, said search and rescue volunteer Tammy Sullivan, the animal's trainer. She said the Australian shepherd Sadie can detect the scent of blood, bone or bodily fluid. The FBI dug up the yard, but they found nothing. She was signaling to something, Sullivan said. As to exactly what it was, I do not know. Then on day 10 and 11, there was the cross-examination of Officer John Ryan. And he was grilled again. Okay, I've still got that. Sorry, that's still going on. That's a copy. That's a copy-paste there. I wrote it twice. <laughs> we carry on. This is quitty C. Uh, oh, my yip says, I don't know the case yet, but cannot find material in Gizmo's archive. Can anyone tell me where I can find more info, please? In the description box, I have linked the deep dive we did about a year ago on this case. I do also think I have a playlist for this. I'll put that in the description box afterwards as well. But if you go to the description box now, the first video that I made is there. So if you just click out of the chat and go to the description, you'll see a little write-up I did. You just click more. And you go down, and then the link will be there. It says, first video I did on this case. Okay, so here we carry on. Trezell and Jacqueline were not where they told police they were on December 19th, because they were like, we were here, we were there, you know, this gas station, that place, whatever. But surveillance showed them at other gas stations, other locations. So already then, police were like, damn, these people are lying. A woman, another Maria, Maria Salas, who was visiting her daughter in Bakersfield. Now, this... This, this one got interesting, okay? She was visiting a daughter in Bakersfield. She said she saw Trezell and Jacqueline walking in September of 2020, and she just felt something wasn't right when she saw them. She heard a really, now, uh, a really loud noise outside and then saw them walking away from a dumpster carrying an ice chest, which is what I have in the background here. That's kind of how they described it and assumed that the noise she heard was from, from them throwing something away. Well, that makes me very sad because we know how it goes with these cases. We can only imagine what they were doing, right? Warrior Aphrodite says, why didn't they just give them back to their parents or CPS? Because they want to cash in and they want to keep cashing in. And they probably thought, oh, it's fine. We'll get away with this. Everything's good. You know, type of, they'll never find the body, something like that. I'm not T-Pain says, wow, keeping the children away from their biological parents, horrible. Yep, and Brenda says she took no pics of them because she felt no level connection towards them. Mm-hmm. So, this woman, Maria Salas, was visiting her daughter, right? She saw Trezell and Jacqueline walking, carrying an ice chest. She heard a loud noise, looked outside, and she's like, whoa, they're walking away from a dumpster. 
and she assumed the noise she heard was from them throwing something away. She felt so uneasy about it that she called her daughter later crying. She was sobbing. She was saying there's something not right with this. They they were up to something. They did something. But the daughter said, don't worry. There's always people at that dumpster. There's people there all the time. So, man. You know, if you feel like that ever, you guys, call the police. Rather be safe than sorry. Rather call. You just never know. You know, if it could um, help in a case. Wow. Hawkeye Seneca says, this case was initially the one that made me subscribe to this amazing channel. Thank you so much. Uh, Crime Mystery Monster says, if they give back or they are taken after they adopt, they have to pay child support on them. Oh, my word. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Well, <laughs> well, there you go. They're like, why don't they just give them back? They're, that. They're like, well, if we keep them, we make money. So, yes, yeah, she called her daughter crying. She said not to worry. People wear that dumpster all the time. Salas later saw Trezell and Jacqueline on the news. And she's like, that's the couple. That's who I was talking about. Wow. Like her, her gut instinct was telling her something was very wrong. Now, on day 12, a forensic examiner said that they tested the van for blood. There were very small spots on the bumper that reacted positively to Blue Star Reagent but they said it was smaller than a grain of rice. Ryan Dean, the boy's biological mother, they also, by the way, didn't test... <laughs> they didn't test for DNA on those small grains of rice to verify if that was Sincere or Classics. Not sure why. Okay, Ryan Dean, the boy's biological mother, said Sincere... So Ryan Dean testified, okay, the boy's biological mother. Man, I feel so bad for her. She said Sincere was happy, smart, funny and loved music and that uh, classic was happy was still learning but was happy she said that she has an apartment in arlington texas now what's interesting is that during the investigation the fbi actually received a tip i do this because maybe they got a call i don't know if they how these whoever submitted the tip but they said that the boys were actually spotted in arlington texas now no one said who that was it's obviously an anonymous tip but <laughs> I would speculate it could have been Trezell or Jacqueline and be like, yep, yep, they're there. Because they're already trying to deflect by saying the biological parents, yep, they took them. You know, maybe they thought it's going to buy them some time or something. But maybe it was just someone else, someone entirely else. Anyway, they say uh, Dean's cell phone did not ping in Cal City until December 23rd, 2020. So that helped them, you know, not that she was a suspect, but eliminate her as a suspect. She wasn't even there in the area at all until December 23rd, 2020, which is where we heard her in that media interview. She was there in the background as well. That was the day she went to see Trezell and Jacqueline to question them. She said they had no emotion on their faces. Jacqueline West's sister, Perla Martinez, took the stand. She said she did not ever meet the children that they adopted. Now, she bought the kids Christmas gifts in 2020. So she'd seen pictures of some of the kids. She bought the kids Christmas gifts, okay? Now, remember, when Trezell and Jacqueline said in that footage we saw, their interview with the media, they said Jacqueline was inside wrapping Christmas gifts, Trezell was outside collecting firewood, and the gate was left open, and that's how the boys ran away. And that the other four were with uh, Wanda, Trezell's mother. That's That was their story. Who wants to bet that those Christmas gifts were not bought or wrapped by Jacqueline, but they were they were really the gifts that Perla had sent, right? Lizard Blizzard says, one, they deserved a loving home. It's about the kids, even if that means do parenting with, our, uh, with biological parents. Two, maybe they were safer with bio parents, right? Yes, thank you so much. Perla never saw photos of the four adopted kids until after the boys went missing. Witness Officer Perez said, photos from September show the four kids and not Sincero Classic, Oren and Orson. Mm -hmm. Then on day 13 to 15, day 13 was mostly DNA evidence and phone call exhibits. <laughs> So that takes me back to Kevin Clark's type timeline. You know, in the Letitia Stark trial, it was a lot of evidence. They brought receipts, okay? Mostly DNA evidence, phone call exhibits, 
criminalist Ji Hak Kim. He said they um, tested gardening tools, toothbrushes, blankets, and many items. On day 14, that's when the children, minors, testified. So three of the West boys testified, a neighbor, a foster child who used to live with the West six years ago, and two of Trezell and Jacqueline's adopted sons. So the 10-year-old adopted son testified, said that Oren went to his mom's grandma's house, but he didn't know where Orson went. He can't remember if the boys were in the car with them when they went to Trezell's parents' house in Bakersfield. So now again, I'm going to say trigger warning because what the kids start saying you know, they start talking about some of the abuse that went on in the house and it's definitely not easy to hear. Anna Souza says, give back their names, right? Yes, give back their names. Sincere and classic Pettis. Okay. Uh, Mel Melanie? Nick says, did they have gifts wrapped for Aaron and Orson? Or beds, toothbrushes, etc.? Apparently they had a triple bunk bed and... You'll see some of the kids testifying to that. But toothbrushes and things like that, I don't know. They didn't seem to have the special blankets with them either. I don't know. Terrible. Okay, so day 14, right? That's where we're at now. So the 10-year-old adopted son testified. He said Oren went to his mom's grandma's house. We just read that one. He said they were not living with them anymore because they cried a lot. So you can hear the type of things that Trezell and Jacqueline told their kids. Like, no. Oren and Orson, sincere and classic, are no longer with us because they cry too much. I mean, what? Like, imagine what's that, what it, that is teaching them. It's terrible. It's really sad. So his, his mom and dad told him that they went to live where they used to live. This was before they moved. The second oldest son said that Oren and Orson were at the Cal City home for one day. He doesn't know where they went after that. He remembers triple bunk beds and he thinks that Oren and Orson were there, but he can't remember clearly. Now, take it easy on the kids, you guys, if anyone's going to be like, oh my word, because their story is definitely, it's very, you can hear their memory is very foggy. And I really, firstly, they're kids, so I would never blame them. They're kids, number one. Two, I think they're very traumatized. And then already memories can just be uh, quite foggy, right? Oh my, yep, I hope you found it. Thank you so much for your four euro super sticker. I hope you found that video. It's so messed up, right? I'm not t paying to make the children seem bad because they were crying a lot. Like, oh, they were crying so much. We just gave them back to where they, the family they came from, right? I mean, wow. The other kids must be like, whoa, okay. My gosh. So the second oldest son remembers triple bunk beds and he thinks that Oren and Orson were there. Of course, we know one definitely wasn't, right? But he can't remember clearly. Then an eight-year-old adopted son refers to the Cal City home as the high desert house. He remembers Oren and Orson being there with them. He said he played with the dogs in the backyard. So you could almost imagine <laughs> Trezell and Jacqueline telling them, no, they were here. Remember, they were here. You know what I mean? If they hear that enough. The eight-year-old said he can't remember when he was asked, okay, tell us something good about your mom. He's like, hmm, can't say a word. Can't say anything good about his mom, which does say a lot. Jacqueline, I mean, uh, the foster child that lived with him for six years before, okay, so before, six years prior, the other foster child had lived with him, said that Jacqueline disciplined them in a not normal way. Cursing at them. And sending them to their rooms. He said she would do. Okay this is what I mean. This is here. It's it's not that hard to imagine. Because we've seen lots of monsters in plain sight. You know what I mean. But when we look at that interview. I'm like whoa. Like I just. I always look at this woman. Like Jacqueline. Like what were you thinking? Like what is wrong with you? Why do you do this? I mean. Trezal too. But. Oh, it's just hard to imagine this. That she's doing this. But yeah. She would do a hold on the boys. Where she would wrap her legs around them. And hold them from their necks with her arms this kid said she would do this for hours at times another one of them said she would do this for about an hour that's a long time to be doing this type of abuse right he was told not to snitch and then he would get something in return 
You said Jacqueline did this when the boys would cry. You said that Trezell would treat his own kids differently, a.k.a. better. When the other children were taken to Trezell's mother's home, so this is what this uh, foster child from six years before says, right? When the other children were taken to Trezell's mother's home, they would return with scars. He was told to go to his room if he said anything about it. He had his own room, enough food, enough clothes, and he went to school. The nine-year-old bio son doesn't rem- This is hectic, you guys. This nine-year-old bio son says he doesn't remember the apartment in Bakersfield. He doesn't remember living there with his parents. And he doesn't recognize the photos of Sincere and Classic, known as Orin and Orson. Whoa. I smell trauma. He said Orin and Orson did not move to the Cal City home with them. He also said the boys went back to their home because they cried. So that's a narrative that's going round and round, right? Wow. He told the police he remembers Orin. This is hectic. So he told the police he remembers Orin getting sick and his color fading. Later they asked him, what do you mean by that? Because they showed the interview again. They asked him these questions on the stand and he's like, I don't know what I meant by that. So then they show the video again. They're like, see, you said that there. You said he was getting sick and his color was fading. He's like, I don't know what I meant there. So that's scary. It's almost like a blocked memory a little bit now. He remembers that he remembers Orin and Orson going to stay with Jacqueline's mother, but he can't remember when. Yes. So, yeah. I don't want to say gaslighting too much. So brainwashing <laughs> sounds like they were all brainwashed a lot and threatened, I'm sure. I'm sure they were very, very scared. So if they ever see this in their life, I hope they know they were very, very brave to testify. He remembers that they were not there for Thanksgiving or for Halloween. He said that Oren choked in his sleep. Trezell and Jacqueline asked him, now this was manipulative as hell, you guys. Trezell and Jacqueline asked him, do you think we should keep this a secret? Because if we don't, they're going to take you all away from us. So, hello, curse of control. Just like, should we? Like, they, they kind of make him feel like he's going to make the decision. Do you think we should keep this a secret? Hmm? You agree, right? Because otherwise they're going to take you all away. Damn. Now, how did he know that he was asked? How did you know that Orin was dead? He said he touched him and he was cold. He said that Orson was in Cal City for four days before his parents took him to Maria's. If the boys cried, now this, where we go, trigger warning. If the boys cried, they would get smacked on the cheek or hit with a pedal stick. On the night that Orin died, Orson was eating with his mouth open, so Trezell and Jacqueline blended his food and put it in a bottle. Orin stole the bottle from Orson. So I hope you're following that story. Yes, mental, emotional abuse like Latisha. And so many kids as well. So many kids traumatized. Um, Kathleen says, yikes, I don't like that the kids will understand and re-traumatize. I know, right? Jacqueline is the adoptive mother, the one that's also being charged with murder. Trezell and Jacqueline West. Okay, so I'm just checking that everyone's okay. <laughs> yeah, Perniel says major trigger bunny. That's why I'm just checking. So that was hectic. On the night that Oren died, Orson was eating with his mouth open, so his parents blended his food and put it in a bottle, but Oren stole the bottle from Orson. So meaning they had that night intended to kill Orson? When his parents saw Oren... Oh, wow. When his parents saw... Adoptive parents saw Oren steal Orson's bottle, they instructed him to punch him. When they moved... Orson was crying. Remember, he was there then, according to the kids here, for four days. 
So Orson was crying. His parents told the other kids it was just because they were in a new place. Okay, wow. He said that he saw on a tablet, so the person on the stand, the, the child on the stand, right? This is so hectic. He saw on a tablet that Oren and Orson were missing. And he realized that his dad had lied about Oren because he had seen him die. He had touched his body. He said it was cold. That he remembers. But he's like, I see my dad on the news and he's saying that Oren and Orson were in the backyard playing and that both of them walked out. So he was like, whoa, he's lying. He didn't know why Orson was missing too. It's a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Day 16. Wanda. Who's Wanda? Trezell's mother. Wanda said that throughout the Rona time, the family would drive by and say hi. Now, to me, a lot of what Wanda says, I'm like, huh, it's interesting. She greeted the four older boys because, you know, the family's driving by. So she greets the four older boys, but she was told the two youngest were in the van. So the whole time, according to her story, she says, Trezell and Jacqueline are saying, they're in the back, way back in the van. But she sees the other four, but not sincere and classic. Interesting. Wanda did not see Oren and Orson on September 19th, 2020, which was moving day. She thought that they were staying with Maria Martinez. Okay. Which is Jacqueline's mother. Now this one, I'm like, eh, I don't know about this man. I feel like you knew more than you're saying, right? She got robes for the entire family for Christmas, but couldn't find sizes for Oren and Orison. So she asked Trezell to get their matching PJs. Look, that might be true, okay? <laughs> but we also weren't born yesterday. You, you bought everybody matching robes? You bought everybody robes, but you couldn't find robes or sizes for sincere and classic the two boys who now we know we're no longer alive that makes me worried right there but anyway just like do you know more you're not telling us everything lady tell us <laughs> december 16th 2020 wanda asked for a photo of the family in their robes by the fireplace but never got it and she says because the boys were already missing which I find interesting because they were only reported missing on December 21st, right? Okay, so Crime Mystery Monster says, no, they were putting orange, the oldest child's food, in a blender and making him eat that way because he ate with his mouth open. I think they were drugging the kids. He drank Orson's double dose. Oh my gosh. They probably were. Oh my word. I'm telling you, this is one of those cases again where things are probably so much worse than what we know. That's the thing. Christy says, could Wanda not buy them PJs? Right? Crime Mystery Monster says, yes, I think they were starving. That's why they cried. Yes. Did you see those pics of them so skinny? Mm-hmm. She was asked to watch the four older boys from December 19th until New Year's. She did not ever see Oren and Orson get out of the van. Because she was around on moving day. Jacqueline told her that they were sleeping in the back of the van. It was dark. Music was playing. So Wanda says she didn't see or hear them. And also didn't really question much. You see, I'm just like a little bit like December 16th, though, you said that you asked for a photo and she got all emotional on the stand <laughs> saying she never got it because the boys were, were missing then. Okay, she said she didn't watch all the kids at the same time when asked like, okay, but wouldn't you normally watch all six? She said, no, she wouldn't watch all the kids at the same time because the youngest, Oren and Orson, were not potty trained and they cried a lot. Yes, Anna says more sinister than we think. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So we saw that.
One of the children was shown on a video talking to a social worker, Sonia Barton, saying that Orin and Orson would get spanked until they shut up because they cried a lot, right? From all the abuse and trauma and probably from being hungry, yes. This uh, one, this child on the video said they bleed, they get blood on their butts, they get hit hard with the metal part of a belt. Day 17. Alexander Calaveras testified by Zoom. It was reported that the boys were spotted at his home in Arlington, Texas, but they were his own boys. Bakersfield PD Sergeant Chad Garrett said that Trezell and Jacqueline had at least five phones. Video of an interview from July 2021 with Jacqueline West was shown. Now, <laughs> is Auntie TT Letitia? Because this is made up crap again. She said Aunt TT, apparently a relative of the bio dad of the boys, would sometimes be at visitation and would watch the boys. So that's her pretending like visitation was still happening. So she made up this Aunt TT is what I'm gathering from everything I heard. I'm like, this is a made up person, right? Is that Aunt TT, Latisha? <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised at this point. Jacqueline describes the boys as... Now, this is a weird description. She's like, Jacqueline describes the boys as super sweet and then super grumpy. Okay, projection. She said they love attention and playing with the kids. Interesting language because they are kids. But she probably means playing with her biological kids, right? <laughs> and it's just like five phones, nothing suspicious here. Mm-hmm. Yes, and that's possible as well. Yes, the boys were both intellectually delayed and because of that received more state funds. It is possible that that happened. Yes. Hmm, Jacqueline, I wish we could see that whole video. Maybe one day we will. So, okay, we've got that. She says she had to change her phone number because the family wouldn't stop contacting her. Oh, is that for the, oh, and why the other five? You know, she got five numbers. On moving day, Jacqueline said she thought the boys were with her. And then she corrected herself and said, I should have said they were with me. Damn. Now, why they, she was asked, why are there no new photos of them? She said, because she's not used to taking photos of them because when they were fostered, they weren't allowed to. <laughs> oh, she's full of excuses everywhere. Excuses everywhere. When asked why one of the boys said that Oren died at the apartment, Jacqueline said he had a very active imagination and someone must be telling him things. Hernandez tells her that he's gathered a massive amount of information and it all leads back to you and Trezell. He tells her he knows Oren and Orson were not at the California city home. He implores her to tell him what happened, whether there was an accident, whether Trezell West did something. Jacqueline West says what happened was very unfortunate, but she and her husband aren't to blame. We've heard that before, right? A call is played between Trezell, Jacqueline, and the kids. They are telling the kids, their own kids, right? Shame, you, you, you sound sad. Just remember... You don't have to say anything to anyone. <laughs> That's how they're comforting the kid. Don't worry. Don't be sad. You don't have to talk to the police. You don't have to say anything to anyone. And at this point, Trezell is emotional in the courtroom when they play this call. So he's feeling bad there for his own kids or what? I don't know, man. Wow. And then the prosecution rested their case. So that's the first 17 days of the trial. Okay, now let's hear the defense's opening statements. In different states, it happens in different ways. Sometimes it's the prosecutor's opening statements, then the defense immediately on the first day. But in this one, it was the prosecution's opening statements, and then they presented the whole case and rested the case. Then it was the defense's opening statements. From what I'm gathering. Okay. Because they, they, yeah. 
because on day 18, 19, and 20, the defense presented their case and they rested their case, which was, I think it was on Friday. You know, it's recent. So tomorrow is supposed to be closing arguments. Okay, so let's play this. Now, one more time for anyone who wasn't here earlier. Yes, they initially had no video footage. You're not allowed to stream the audio. You're not allowed to watch, you know, not watch, listen to the court stream, record it, share it, put it anywhere. You may not. It's against the law. So there were some people that did that. That was illegal. This is what mainstream media has just put out. And I mean, these are the only videos available now, which would be the opening statements. So they've obviously allowed that because mainstream media has this court. Um, the court had cameras in the courtroom for opening statements. So we get to see that, but we don't see anything else. It's been a very difficult trial to follow. So <laughs> I hope the bullet points helped a little bit though, because I myself was feeling quite overwhelmed of like, I want to know, I want to know what's happening in this case, you know? So went down that rabbit hole, brought out the bullet points. Hope it made sense. Okay, so now let's listen to the defense's opening statements. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Trezell West. This is Jacqueline West. And their two sons are missing. Their sons, Oren and Orson, are missing. And we're here because it's easier to charge them than for them to explain why they couldn't find them. They've been married 12 years in March. Trezell will explain, you'll hear in the interview, that when he first met Jacqueline, her understanding of love and their love together changed his whole perspective on things. It changed how he saw religion. He goes into it with the detectives. That love manifested into a little family of eight. And they were proud of the life they had built and moved out to the desert and got themselves a little house. This is COVID times. Some people hoard toilet paper. Some people drank and knit. And other people kind of moved on from urban areas because they saw the system come to a halt. That is what the West did. They went out to Cal City to try to be self-reliant. And let's face it, out in Cal City, they're unique. They are a biracial family of eight made up of couples of brothers that are also biracial. They are an artist and a producer who are trying to be self-reliant out in Cal City, who homeschool their children, and yes, primarily make $4,000 a month to support that family of eight for taking care of children none of us were taking care of. And this is suspicious to Cal City. And you can see that from the start of this investigation. Just want to pause for a second. Crime Mr. Monster says the defense, two witnesses. That is all they had. Dr. Napolitano tried to destroy the oldest child's testimony, which is why I didn't bullet point that. It's very hard to listen to that, just like pulling that apart. She has not done a child forensic interview in 17 years. And Anne-Marie Chen says Trezell's defense went on the first day. Her lawyer presented after the defense. You mean after the prosecution rested, right? Thank you, Anne-Marie Chen. This is all suspicious to them. And with uniqueness also comes oddness sometimes. And you can see in the interviews when they talk to Cal City, sometimes they say some odd things, but they are always forthright. They are always sharing everything with Cal City PD because they want to be removed as suspects so they can find their boys. And sometimes they say some things that are true, but Cal City doesn't want to hear. In the spirit of openness, Jackie explains sometimes she forgets their anniversary. That's a Trezell thing. Trezell explains it is easy and more hygienic to sit down when he pees. That is the level of openness they are giving Cal City PD so they can check them off and find their kids. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm really trying not to snark at all. Do your job, bro. <laughs> it's just a few things. Okay, I'm just going to leave it at that. They started adopting because they heard about brothers that get torn apart in the system. They didn't know family members could get separated in the system. And Trezell, working as a security guard, realizes he's, all he's getting done is getting paid to stop homeless people from stealing food and decides, you know what, why don't I spend my time trying to help kids? And when he gets there, he starts to realize there's not a lot of males in the system, let alone males of color, let alone black males who are going to be fathers to black children in the system. He tells this to detectives. That is why he got involved. But he also explains to the detective <clears> that once you get involved after about 60 some odd kids come ripping in and out of your house, after a teenager puts hands on you in your own house, you start to feel different. You have to kind of compartmentalize 
And Jacqueline says the same thing. Oh, man. Okay, so just so you know, I did speed this up a bit like all these videos we've seen. Otherwise, we will be at all night or afternoon so it's at 1.1 speed even though it actually seems it almost seems like 1.4 or 5 but it's 1.1 is what i said it at and because of this they love their children's but love that gets drugged through the system is a little bit different cal city doesn't like that and they'll say it in the interview and although they have no experience with adoption or fostering they don't really like some of the answers they're getting trazelle explains the reason why he got Orrin and Orson and why he was so proud of them is they were two little black boys just like him. And he was going to be a father to them and he was going to raise them and be there for them. And then he's in his backyard and they go missing. And now he's sitting here on trial. Because they can't answer where the boys went. And they can't account for this. This is the video was explained in the opening. We know up in here, this is not as good, the TV's gone, but my body would have blocked the TV. You're going to get a chance to see this. We'll go through this later. As, we, as we've heard, we're going to review all this footage. Up in here, we know that that is where Mr. Uh, West is doing yard work. I'll start this. You know, this is getting around the time, right? The mark when we know. And we know that Mr. West turns the lights on once they've realized the children are missing. Why don't you look right up here? See some, you see some light? Something going on right here. And keep paying attention because eventually whatever's causing that is going to show itself. Because Mr. West says once he knows it happened all so fast, he's telling officers he thinks it might be three minutes, which I don't like. And yes, he was fiddling about there and really not looking for the kids, standing under a tree from what I remember. Wow. And yes, by the way, it's mirrored. This is flipped because I thought it just looked better <laughs> when I did it. When, when I, I forgot about the screen thing. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So the light source is back, and now what's causing that reveals itself. That is a car going down 108, leaving the area. This is the West house. That's a car leaving the area about at the end of the block from their house. You will now notice we're in the time, Mr. Smith pointed out, the 620 where he leaves to start to begin that the boys are missing. And we're about a minute out from this light turning on. So, they can't explain that. I'm willing to bet most officers don't even know about that. Right. <laughs> and you'll see in the interviews, I think the three minute estimate he gives him is too small to hear him talk about it. Okay, enough for the BS video. Carry on there, bro. <laughs> About a minute out from that car leaving. And we know the light goes on when they've started to realize that they are not in the yard and they're not inside. About a minute and a half from that car went by. Something else they don't have answers for. There's give or take 41 registered sex offenders in Cal City. It means 41 individuals we put on a list because they are a risk to children. They don't talk to any until January 1st. That's not the 22nd, the 23rd, the 24th, the 25th, the 26th, the 26th. It's kind of what the defense is going for. What they were going for is like they didn't check all the SOs, the offenders in the area. They only checked a few, but they should have checked them all because it's definitely them that did it, right? 7th, the 28th, the 29th, the 30th, the 31st. I'm not going to put this down, but you know the first comes next. That's when they talk to sex offenders. And all of them know they went to four houses. They talked to two. One, they talked to the person's mom. That apparently was enough for them. And then they talked to a roommate. The others, they don't have an answer for that. Before they ever do this, they get a call from someone named Hector Rodriguez. He tells them he's got information, he wants to talk to an agent, he's worried for his safety, tells them you need to check a house in Blythe, but I need someone to talk to me. They check the house in Blythe, they don't ever contact him. Hector Rodriguez, with that same birth date, is a sex offender in Kern County who's been out of compliance since 2009. 
They don't talk to him. He went to them. We got glossed over a little bit, but there is in the initial paperwork from CPS, when this is starting to develop, as well as in official filings, the definitive statement, there is video footage of the children walking down the street. And now everyone's like, well, oh, you'll see them. No one really knows where that came from. No one knows who said it, why it's written so definitively. They'll tell you they wrote that, meaning that's like a suggestion of something they're hoping to find. It's pretty definitive. It's in a court filing. They won't be able to explain that. Damn, bro. So now it's like a conspiracy or what? <laughs> there were other kids walking in the street. They did say that. Jacqueline said that, but she didn't go talk to them. Anyway. A woman in Texas called them. That's fine. Let's continue. Texas, a woman calls and says around Christmas time she sees two little, uh, two little black boys in the neighborhood. She says eventually she meets them and she's told their names are Orin and Orton. And a man corrects them and says, no, your name's Derek. That's never followed up on. Just also, they don't have answers around inconsistent some of this investigation is there will be cops that will say there's no diapers, but there is diapers. There will be officers that say there's no chalk, well, there is chalk. There will be officers that say there wasn't clothes, well, there is clothes. There will be officers that say there was no toothbrushes, there were toothbrushes. There will be some officers who rely on the fact that the dog didn't smell the boys specifically. You will hear from the dog handler that the dog smells cadavers or humans. The dogs that were there were not trained to smell individuals specifically. And she'll tell you when she was there the first night, the dog couldn't do much because the area had so many people walking around through the yard, it was contaminated. And she'll tell you the only job they gave her was follow the route that Charles L's van took to see if the dog finds body parts. That's the first night. Also, the videos we will discuss about boys, uh, the family coming or the family going, even by the officer's account, they can only identify three boys. Like, there's issues with that footage. There's issues with these interviews. They're inconsistent. The boys are inconsistent from what, what they're saying. They contradict what adults that were in Cal City said. They retract things they've said. They've gone back on certain statements. They conflict with each other. And what you will see is interview techniques used by Officer Hansen is improper for children. And with Officer Hansen, it also extends to adults. That is a table. That is Miss West. That is his hand on her thigh. He never handled this investigation like she was the mother of missing sons. This was a tragic accident, is what the evidence will show. All right? They don't have an answer for it. Okay. Two minutes ago, or maybe five, you were saying that they should have checked all the S offenders in the area. Okay. But now it's a tragic accident? Because it was tragic. But instead, Trezell is here on a murder charge. The bottom line is Cal, Zit, Cal City out the gate just never thought anyone would take two little black boys. That's why the investigation will look the way it did. This is Trezell West. This is Jacqueline West. And their two little boys are missing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Those correspondents, do you wish to make an open statement? Right. Okay. Damn, what happened to the sound there? Wait, where's the lady? <laughs> I know, right? Accident. Okay, wait one second. Let's do this. Doesn't the lady say things? Okay, wait. I don't know what happened to that sound there. Uh, I'm punk for something quickly. Also, while I do that, I just quickly want to show you something else here. Um, this is where this is shared from. Okay. Bakersfield, California, Thursday marked day 21 of the West trial. Much of the focus was on the judge reading instructions to the jury ahead of the closing arguments and jury deliberations. With just days left until the case is given to a jury, the defense on Thursday brought psychologist and children forensic interviewer evaluated Dr. Susan Napolitano to the stand. Through her questioning, defense attorney Alexia Torres Stallings tried to show that California city police and social workers were asked biased and leading questions to the West's eldest son. So they say the questions were crap, basically, right? Eyewitness News caught up with the local attorney, Mark Anthony Raimondo, who's not involved in the case, to get his thoughts on the defense's strategy. He said, whenever you have a child interview and even adults, you have to be very, very careful of confirmation bias. Yes, you do. 
on passing off your own subconscious beliefs in the case, we saw that with Dr. Lewis <laughs> in the Letitia Stout case, oh my word, when the investigation switches from an investigating officer of an open-minded to somebody with a subjective opinion that's easily transposed onto any child with any leading question. Listen here, don't ask snap me. <laughs> it's like, oh, snap. Moving on. If you don't see that on the screen, you're probably like, what is she saying? <laughs> okay, wait. So they're just, they're just recapping everything we just went over, but they say, this is what I'm trying to get to, closing arguments will be on Tuesday at 9 a.m. Prosecutor Eric Smith will start. Both Jacqueline and Trezell's lead attorneys will give their closing arguments, and then Smith will end. After that will be jury deliberations. So that's, we just did a, a big recap um, of the whole trial. I just want to find quickly this, I just want to bring this over. I'm going to bring this one, which would be the defense for Jacqueline West. That's the last thing we still have to see. And I'm also going to put this at 1.25 or so. Let's go. For her six children in her brand new house in California City when her two youngest were taken. Trezell, her husband of 13 years, was gathering wood for to light a fire for Jackie and their two youngest children when they were taken. There is, There are no confessions and there is no forensic evidence. All we have is a story of a 10-year-old boy, their boy, their eldest child. This is Jackie West, and this is Trezell West, and their two youngest children were taken. But their four oldest children ends is where our case begins. People versus the West. This timeline is going to be imperative. Throughout the trial, we have talked about December 21st, December 22nd, December 23rd, 24th, 5th, 6th, and 28th. And it is no different in the defense's case that that timeline is going to be the timeline to evaluate. What you have heard at this point in time, which would have arguably been discussed in our in our timeline. It's amazing how there's no evidence of them being taken, but they're like, yep, they were taken. <laughs> is the investigation that was going on during that time. But there was a separate investigation that was also occurring at the same time that, that, the, um, that law enforcement was investigating, and that was Child Protective Services. When we look at December 21st and we evaluate the, date, the um, incidences that are the most relevant for the defense's case, we are looking specifically at where does the priming occur with Adrian. Priming is going to be a term that is going to be used by our child forensic psychologist expert, Dr. Susan Napolitano, who I will talk about in just a second. When we talk about December 21st, we've already heard testimony that there was a proof of life or a welfare check that was, that was made at Wanda's residences when the boys were spending the night there. We have no information on how many officers were there, whether or not they were wearing uniforms, whether or not they were wearing patrol, they were wearing patrol uniforms in patrol vehicles, spotlights, yelling. We have no information as to the proof of life call. But that essentially starts the priming. When we talk about December 21st, we have another and another entrance from another agency where CPS has now filed this emergency out referral. But remember what the, the referral was only for Orson and Orin, general neglect, because there were four declarative statements that were made in that referral, that they went missing, that law enforcement was there, and that there was a video of them walking down the street. And because of the information that was provided to the referral, this prompted a 10-day general neglect call. Not immediate, not three, not five, 10 days. When we move on to the next day, December 22nd, 2020, this is a rough outline of the events that occurred as they related to the children. At approximately seven or 8 a.m., Officer Hansen came and interviewed the children. You have seen those interviews now, of which most law enforcement have not seen. He was untrained, he had no formalized training, only on the job training to speak to children. Dr. Napolitano is going to talk about the fact that an individual should have some type of training when they speak with children in order to prevent any type of implantation that can then result in false allegations or false memory. Again, this is the beginning of the prime. Around 10 to 11 a.m., there is the FBI and Wanda have now taken the boys to the Jameson Center. We have this information as provided in Sonia Barton's first interview. 
she notes the time as she takes Adrian to go and interview him. Then we have a second interview of Adrian that was made almost two hours later, 1255, also by Miss Barton, that will be played now. At around 3 p.m., they were detained by CPS and taken from their parents. Some of you may recall the testimony that has already been provided by Clifton Taylor, the importance of a detainment and that a forensic interview happens after a detainment, because if not, the case, the juvenile dependency case would be dismissed. Stakes were running high for CPS. On December 23rd, the next sort of priming is that we now know that Barton, Sonia Barton, and court social worker Pamela Castillo are involved in text communications. We address that with Ms. Barton because the importance of objectivity and a neutral mindset for a forensic interviewer is of the utmost importance, as will also be discussed by Dr. Napolitano. We know, we know now that on December 23rd, the FBI went and did ground penetrating radar into the home of Aspen, of which there was no evidence no human remains found. We also know that on December 23rd, the, the van was forensically analyzed by Mr. Bianca and Ms. Brown, of which there was no forensic evidence found. December 23rd is when the filing of this juvenile proceeding now takes it into the court system for the juvenile round, or when the detainment is officially filed. The boys are not going back to Wanda. They are not going back to the West residence. 25th, 26th, 27th, we have nothing. But remember when we talked about the first report with Sonia Barton, and we talked about how important that sometimes reporting in a caregiver situation or with another parent oftentimes goes without a report. So we do not know what, if any information is going on within those four days. But what we do know, according to Adrian, is that he has access to an iPad, he has access to the internet, and he has access to find information about this case. And then the 28th occurs. We will know that at 8 a.m. there is a juvenile dependency matter going on in which court social worker Pamela Castillo is present along with the West. We will know that approximately around 9 a.m. there is some communication about the detention having issues with the initial contact. And then at 11 a.m there is the first communication from Sonia Barton to Officer Hansen. You will later learn that in these delivered service logs, these are like reports akin to police reports that are kept by CPS that Ms. Castillo tried to make contact with, Mr. Han with Officer Hansen and did not. And at a later point in time, had only contacted the FBI, which then she lied to Officer Hansen that she had had any communication with any law enforcement at all. And then approximately 3.36, is Adrian's third interview. We have heard no circumstances in which or how that first report was made. Who was present? When were they present? How were they present? Where were they present? Whether or not he had received any information prior to hand, whether or not Miss Maribel Moreno was emotional. And all of this is going to be evaluated and examined by our expert, Dr. Susan Napolitano. She is a child forensic psychologist leading in her field for nearly 30 years. But unlike other experts, Dr. Napolo has, Napolitano has a unique perspective in that at one point in time, she too was in a forensic interviewer. Okay, I'm just gonna pause for a second. Remember earlier, crime mystery monster said to us, uh, the defense, two witnesses, that's all they had. Dr. Napolitano <laughs> tried to destroy the oldest child's testimony She's not done a child forensic interview in 17 years. Mm -hmm. And now she examines forensic interviews at the bequest of the prosecution, the defense, the FBI, post criminal or post exoneration convictions. Her, her, uh, her background is exemplary. She has had a numerous, numerous amount of time regarding training, peer review and articles, written articles. When we talk about Dr. Napolitano, she is going to first talk about the history of forensic interviews. Why is it so important? Well, because the history of the forensic interview starts in the 1980s and the 1990s, 
a part of, excuse me, with a slew of cases that were mass hysteria, child sex abuse cases, the McMartin cases. But not only did that case occur, but Kern County, we uniquely fit in the history of forensic interview, interviews with the Stoll case. It still remains the largest and longest and most expensive trial in the state of California. In those cases, these specific cases that have come as a result of forensic interviews, nearly all of them have, that have now since been exonerated. So she is going to talk about the importance of the history of forensic interviews and how it changed the landscape the policies, the procedures, and what is needed for a good forensic interviewer. Because at the end of the day, the only goal for a forensic interviewer is to be in a fact-finding mission. Confirmation bias is another topic that she will talk about and how confirmation bias will seep into an investigation and ultimately bleed over to the forensic interviewer when it is there. Conf confirmation bias, if you are not, excuse me, if you're not looking for it, you won't see it. That's essentially what confirmation bias is. If you intend on only seeing one aspect of a case. At least we know what Dr. Lewis had going on. A whole bunch of confirmation bias in the Letitia Stark trial. We've got eight minutes more of this, okay? You will miss everything else, like use diapers. So she is going to talk about the importance of confirmation bias and how when it, when it initiates or in, it is in the inception of an investigation, that it can then permeate into the rest, which ultimately can lead into a forensic interviewer. And as a result of that, she will state that this misinformation, misinformation, can then blend into the interview with the child. What does that, what does that then provide? Well, it provides false memories or false allegations. In reviewing the in, in reviewing the, the totality of the interviews that that Dr. Napolitano is going to testify, she is going to look at certain data points. The outline that has already been addressed is an outline or a data point in which she is going to review. But she is going to take into consideration Hansen's videos, as in one and two. She is also taking into consideration Adrian's first interview with Sonia Barton on the 22nd, as well as Sonia Barton's second interview. What she is going to say, what she's going to testify to is that Sonia Barton's second interview is an inherently suggestible, that she is brow beating the child until they can acquiesce into what she wants him to say. Again, priming, priming for that subsequent and last interview on the 28th. But by that point in time, it is too late. He has been primed and the, the statement has already been made. And then after this, it becomes repeated questions after repeated questions after repeated questions from law enforcement, from the DA's office, from grand jury testimonies to trial. Now, before all of you, he has been primed for the last three years. He has not seen his parents. They have not seen their parents or talked to them for the last year. He has been in the home or the custody of two people, Miss Moreno, and Ms. Isiaga. And as testified to earlier, law enforcement, Detective Hernandez and others have been going in and out and interviewing him. Testimony is going to be another key data point that we are going to, that she is going to evaluate. There will be someone here to read the grand jury testimony and you will see that there is a comparison how Adrian reacts to both the grand jury testimony and to the trial after the break. That is going to be a key data point in which she is going to use for her evaluation. What she will ultimately conclude, taking everything, all of the data points that she has evaluated, these videos, these transcripts, and her 30 years of experience, she is going to conclude that there was implantation, coercive techniques, and that because of it, he was more susceptible to the likelihood of false allegations and false memories. Because ladies and gentlemen, what we have here, it's not peas. It's not peas. From there, we are going to move on to our... I'm just going to say all this implanting and false memories. It sounds more like what Trezell and uh, Jacqueline did. Okay, this is the comment I'm going to make. Our next expert, Christopher Armstrong. Christopher Armstrong comes before you also with 30 years experience. But his experience is unique in that he has an engineering background. He also, it, what he does for a living, is a forensic accident reconstructionist. Now, I understand that some of you are thinking, where does this come into play? 
Well, it's going to come into play with the videos that you folks have been watching at 10649 Aspen Avenue. The videos that were acquired by Detective Hernandez on, excuse me, Detective Ryan on December 27th were then later enhanced by the FBI. Mr. Armstrong just took the videos and enhanced them a little bit more. He also was able to enhance Zoom and take a still of December 19th, 2020. The video in which Detective Ryan says there's only two, two uh, adult individuals and four children going into the car. But when you look, and you will be able to see it on the large screen TV, but when you look at the still image that is going to be provided to you, it is apparent that there is an individual carrying something or someone of which none of this was done by the FBI or by law enforcement. What he's also going to talk to you folks about is the video, the video of the car, the car in which no one saw prior to the opening with Mr. Hennessy. Got two and a half more minutes. Just remember, I've sped this up to 1.25 speed, okay? So yes, very passionate attorney, even more so at 1.25 speed, okay? But that car, that he is going to testify and talk to had a unique light source, AKA the headlights, in which he can evaluate with his, with his uh, expertise that the lights were going from low to high, high to low, and then low to high again. Insinuating that a vehicle stopped, reversed, and went forward again. Now, the other aspect of his testimony is going to be the videos themselves because at the end of the day, you cannot see the children walk through the video. But that isn't, and that has nothing to do, has something to do with the quality of the actual video, but it actually has everything to do with how we perceive, how we see things. And he's gonna talk about contrast ratios and why they're important when you evaluate and look at these types of videos. He's also gonna talk about lumin lum luminosity studies that law enforcement could have done to determine whether or not these videos were accurate to see if you could have seen a child walk across the field or not, which can only be done during the anniversary of the event. We are several years from that event. So it could have been done, not once, but twice. He is going to talk about how the contrast ratios and videos, that the way that a person dresses, their stature, their ethnicity, will all take, will all be, uh, 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 excuse me, data points in which he will take into consideration when he's evalu evaluating those videos. At the conclusion of our case, it is still a tragedy. While the defense experts will give you folks insight, they're not gonna answer all of the questions. The outstanding question of where the boys are will still be remaining. And as Mr. Hennessy said, it is still going to be a tragedy. But we believe that at the conclusion of our case, that if reasonable doubt is not already apparent enough, that you will have reasonable doubt and you will provide the only reasonable and just verdict of not guilty on all counts. Thank you. Damn. Okay. Okay. I don't know about that. Sure. Okay. We've gone over all the charges and things. If you want to see documents, I put out uh, the indictment document on patreon today if you want to see that um if you want great notifications they're also there what that that okay so that was the defense for jacqueline west delivering her opening statements in the trial so now we've seen all three the prosecution the defense for trizel and the defense for jacqueline so <laughs> i hope that I mean, damn, okay, I was like, could we do this in three hours? We did it. We recapped the whole trial as much as possible in three hours. So what I want to show you quickly now is, wait, this lady, Veronica Morley, journalist at 23 ABC News and graduate of CSU Bakersfield. Damn, like this lady, she put, look, look, look minute by minute reporting as the audio was going so because you can't stream the audio you can't share it you can't record it but she was updating everyone like literally minute by minute so make sure you go follow her and like and reshare i'll I still have to reshare a whole bunch here as you can see but that helped a lot with all my notes today and then lawyer mystery maven on youtube 
if you want to listen to extensive bullet points, we're talking an hour per day, okay? Go and check out Lawyer Mystery Maven if you want to hear um, every day of the trial with millions of bullet points, okay? I just brought you, I picked out um, the highlights, even though I don't like calling it highlights because I know this trial, it's it's a very grim topic, but you know what I mean. Okay, so <laughs> Daniel says, shout out to the court recorders. That seems like a crazy job, <laughs> right? So that is what we have uh, for today. We've done some map time. We've looked at the in initial interview, recap the entire trial. Tomorrow's closing ar arguments um, at 9 a.m. I think it's a 9 a.m. Um, Pacific time, right? So nine, wait, <laughs> 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it was 5 p.m. my time. I might be able to listen in, but I can't stream it. Okay, we can't do that. I don't know if they'll be showing it or what they'll be doing, but I'd rather be very safe and make sure that I don't stream anything wrong. So we'll see what happens with that. Thank you so much for listening to all of that. I do want to say that tomorrow there's a very sad case. The Ellen Greenberg case, it's botched. Okay, they need our help. If you know anything about the Ellen Greenberg case, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, please go check out my playlist. Tomorrow, the private investigator on Ellen's case is working with the family is joining us here at Grizzly True Crime. He's going to be talking to us about the case, which I'm very excited for as well uh, to hear that. Christina said, do you have the defense's witness bullet point? I don't because I just really, it just hurt so much that they were pulling apart the, the eldest son's testimony, really just poking holes, but like in a very ugly way. I just don't have those bullet points because that's where I was just like, I can't, I can't, I just can't do it. Okay. It just was horrible. I didn't want to read that out loud. <laughs> so sorry about that. But you can listen to it on this lady's channel, Lawyer Mystery Maven. Day 17, 18, 19, and 20. So day 18, 19, and 20. You can listen to all that there, okay? So before I go, I do want to just quickly uh, put this on in the background like this. And I just want to remind us all what the case is about, even though I know we know, especially in this community. But I just quickly want to... Uh, So we remember to think of sincere and classic. Please call them by their real names if you can, meaning the names they were born with. It hurts their family, I'm sure, to hear Orin and Orson West. That's their adoptive names. Wow. So let's see what happens in the closing arguments, and let's see when, <laughs> when Trezell and Jacqueline, will they face the music? What's going to happen? I don't actually know. I don't know how to feel about this, but I think the prosecution did a good job of showing tons of evidence from everything that I've uh, listened to and read and just caught up on. I think they did a very good job. Okay. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining me. Um, if you guys do go over to Lawyer Mystery Maven, if you don't uh, search for this yourself, I will link it in the description box right after this. And, you know, I'm going to do timestamps. So if you do go over there, make sure you say, hi, I'm from Grizzly True Crime. And send her lots of love, okay? I think her recap was amazing. Like, oh my word. I can't imagine what her notebook looks like. Because <laughs> to listen to the audio and make those notes and then bring it to people in an hour like that, it's amazing. So, okay. 
I will let me just see quickly. What are the boys' last names? Uh, Peters. It's like this. I'll show you. I've had it on the whole stream. Um, this banner before I go. Sincere and classic Peters. That's their real names. So please share that. All right. If you haven't yet, please like this video and share it. Um, hashtag justice for sincere and classic. Hashtag West Boys Trial is also one that's being used on social media. Or the West Trial. Okay. So you can use those as well as Grizzly True Crime. I will see you tomorrow. This stream should lead you to that one. If not, just check my channel as you do on the homepage, especially if you're subscribed with the bell on. Uh, then you'll get the notification for tomorrow when we're going to discuss Ellen Greenberg's case with a PI. Very much looking forward to that. And if you worry about notifications for a dollar on Patreon, you'll get all the notifications. They're very reliable. Okay. And I make everything like super affordable, which is also why. Thank you so much to all the members. We've got so many green names in here. I really appreciate it. Sorry, in the beginning, I didn't even say hi, patrons, members. And everyone, thank you so much. And still, thank you for all the coffees and everything that you guys do to support me. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Copper Horse. You say great work, Gisela. Thank you so much. Um, so let's see what happens in this trial as well. I hope for justice, for sincere and classic. All right, everyone. Stay safe. Have a good evening, whatever time it is for you. Maybe morning. See you tomorrow. Bye.